dun 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 That was Jackie singing along. This is Howie Mandel. Howie Mandel does stuff, and that was my... Go ahead. Who are you? Jacqueline Schultz, your daughter. I know, but I wanted you to say it. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're very excited because on this episode, as you heard, this is the first episode where Jackie actually said she liked our theme song because her husband produced it. But m more importantly, she said, can I write the lyrics? And I said, okay, go ahead. And that was the lyrics to this song. <laughs> How does it go again, uh, Jackie? Dun, dun, sh dun, 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 and at the end it's do, 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 That's great. You know, I don't know. It's like uh, Bernie Topin and Elton John. Remember uh -huh. Elton John used to write all the music and Bernie Topin wrote the lyrics and your husband uh -huh. wrote the music and you're the Ber Bernie Topin of the Schultz family. Yeah. Can yeah. I ask, can I take, do you want me to keep my mask on? Um, if you're watching this, uh, my daughter who usually sits beside me is in another basically another building, um, <laughs> looking I'm at in me. Jail. I'm in prison. <laughs> yeah, there's a jail cell behind I know. you. <laughs> that's because that's the only place where, uh, because you're on the podcast with me, we get good cell service. <laughs> and uh, How many times do you use that joke? Uh, a day? Yeah. I don't know. But anyway, it's not about the number of times. It's about the quality of use. Um, you don't need a mask. You're not wearing near me. I mean, a wall is a mask for okay, me. Okay. And the reason she's doing that is uh, her little guy, my uh, my grandson, Axel, came home with a runny nose and we are germaphobes and freaked. And he got a test, as you told me, right? Mm -hmm. And they test everything now. They can test in one test. It tests for COVID. Because well, COVID. He, didn't get, he didn't get a COVID test. His pediatrician has a machine that tests for everything not every test is like that like you can just get a covid test and most people do just get a covid test but he got a swab and it tested for 15 different things that it could be which it came back negative for covid and positive for rhinovirus which is just the common cold he's a, a he's allergic to rhinoceroses and he's got a virus <laughs> from yeah. a rhino so he has a cold yeah so the fact that he has a cold doesn't uh kind of uh I mean, that's great news and that he doesn't have COVID and he just has a cold and he has a runny nose. But as you know, he lives with his mother. And uh, so she's in a house where somebody has a cold. So I don't want to be near his mother <laughs> because I'm traveling. I'm traveling and I'm doing things and I can't, uh, I can't. I think most people think it's just uh, COVID that people are so concerned about. But it, it's been this way for you forever yeah COVID. so you wearing headsets talking to me from another room is just like every day at home it's life it's what i grew up with <laughs> <laughs> i know and you're still but you're still my baby girl uh first of all uh i'm excited about today's podcast today's podcast i, I say this a lot but I, I i mean it i think i mean it all the time but because i have a lot of friends and i've been doing this for 40 years but i'm very excited about the guest this year jeff ross is here the uh the Roastmaster General. I have so much to ask him and talk to him about. Really? Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Because I saw him live. Yeah, I know you did. Yeah. Uh, you saw him live? You could finish I saw him live when I went to go see Charlie Sheen. Yeah, Charlie yeah. Sheen was on tour mm -hmm. and Jeff went with him? Yeah, I saw him in Atlantic City. I kind of forget if he was opening or just with him, like interviewing him during the show. I know he was with him during the show, but I forget if he also opened for him. And um, another exciting thing I got, you know, I, I got my certificate today to, uh, I am now a certified, I think just in the state of California, am, I'm a doula. So I- uh, That sucks. Why? Because that's what Alex, my brother, wanted to do. And you just took it from him before he got his certification. Alex, did you want to be a doula? I didn't know that. We talked about that. Oh. Yeah. I have it. Look at this. It's okay. No. <laughs> But can it be, oh, you know what? Howie Mandel and son, doulas. We'll have uh, doula like- Doula together. Doula together. That was your thing? Cause I got it, I got it today in the mail. See, look. Look. Yeah. That's my certificate. I got a certificate. So- Wait, uh, are you serious? What is that? 
It's uh, from the National Association of uh, Doulas. I'm going to deliver babies. No, you're not. Well, yeah, I am, but not like you think. Okay. Like if baby, who's got a, the loudest can in the world? <laughs> Somebody just opened the, is that you? Yeah. Don't hold up. We They're not sponsors. I, who cares? Not everything has to be a sponsor. For It's the only way you. for us to make money. We don't have any Lou sponsors Dinos right is here now. too. Lou Dinos has amazing stories. You called me the other day, Lou, and you said you wanted to be on because you had, uh, you, you thought a good segment for our podcast would be. He has, he, what he's saying is he, he has these, he calls me a lot or texts me. Mm -hmm. I usually get a text like once a month and the text just says, Psst, P -S 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 -T. P-S-S-S-T. From Lou? I think it's from Lou. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, you know, and then he says, you know, on the podcast, c can I come on and tell true stories? Mm -hmm. And I said, what kind of story? He's just, they're just short. Just say it into this mic. What is? What did you do the other day? This is a true, I swear to people, and you can look it up, you can do your research. I know people have conspiracy. Talk to the mic. I am making a effort to mine uh, uh, jokes where no one has uh, been before. No, but tell the true story. Uh, the, uh, I, the day I bought a pencil. Okay, that was it. So that's yeah. what he called me, and he said, I can come in every week with all these stories. Today I bought a pencil. That's right. It and sounds I said, very similar not to today. J the day. Okay, well it sounds the very the day I bought a pencil. Similar to Jeremy's story that we heard not that while ago, not a long time ago, about his haircut. Jeremy got a haircut. Yeah, remember, and he said he woke up and he didn't like it, so he cut it. It sounds very similar. That to that's that another kind of true story. story. Yeah. So people, I know that the podcasts that do are the the crime podcasts and other things like that, they do very well because they're true and relatable. Mm -hmm. And that's why, and that's what we want to do. There is a reason. Well, hopefully not relatable to most people. Really? True crime? No, you think no, that's no. that's relatable to most no, people? No, but the, it's relatable because they go, okay, I had a relationship, but it didn't go like, like they can, they go, or I'm married and I'm afraid my wife will snap or things like that. So, but this way, <laughs> <laughs> to, and that gets a, a big audience, but it's a narrow audience. But uh -huh. if somebody comes in and they say, the other day I bought a pencil, yeah. there's probably thousands of people out there listening going, I bought a pencil also. And that captures like a wide. <laughs> a wide. There is a reason of, why, and I, I feel bad, Keep you know, I'm not tooting our horn, but we are number 30 in Croatia. And I'm 25, sure. 25, <laughs> 31 in Trinidad, unless it went up why do you jeremy it wrong I, because i once i heard 30 anyway and that's they, that's lou has a bag of chips and a oh, there's their phone call look at that uh oh that might be a good idea maybe i'll do that a little later uh, you know my mother <laughs> when she was 91 still had streaks of black in her hair, yet she still insisted she couldn't work. Did you hear about um, TikTok hosting ads for whipped cream, but it's actually nitrous oxide? No, mm -hmm. no. Is that true? Mm -hmm. Wow. I know somebody's mother who had wisps <laughs> of shit in her panties, and yet she did work. <laughs> These are all true stories. All right. That's what you prepared? Wisps. Didn't you say wisps of black? What did no. you say? What did you say? I said streaks. You have a funny story. It, 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 this on a, on a kind of serious funny note. Uh oh. What? Uh oh. I don't know where you're going, but okay. No, my mom, we have something in common. Our moms, uh, Lou and I started together. My mom is in- God bless your mom. How is she doing? Late stage Alzheimer's. It's not fun and it's, it's sad and it's heartbreaking. But you once told me a, a, a funny story because you, you, your mother in her last uh, few years was in assisted living. That's right. And one of the funniest stories I heard because when you have Alzheimer's or dementia, you're- Mine goes places. You know, my mother was probably the most astute. She was the number one real estate uh, salesperson in she was Canada. A wonderful lady. I have and nothing but everybody, fun and that's the person that I would talk to. I don't mm -hmm. know anybody smarter, more uh, aware, mm -hmm. uh, more uh, you know, and and even friends who had problems with their own parents would come and talk to my mother. So it's 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 heartbreaking. Mm 
But you talked about your mother was in a similar situation yeah. and you walked in and you go, Mama, how are you? And she would go, Natalie from room 702 took my underpants. And you go, okay, mom, mom, anyway, you're having a nice day. And then you would just ignore her. And that, right. that was a night. Nice, and the next day you'd come in and you'd bring her little flowers or whatever. And you say, how are you, mommy? And she would go, Natalie took another pair of my underpants at three o'clock. And you go, okay, mom, 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 let's watch TV. Yeah. And then you'd watch Jeopardy together or something like that. And the third day you come in and you go, mommy, how are you? And she goes, Natalie took all my underpants. And you go, please, mom, just settle down. We're gonna have a nice time, we'll watch TV, you have a nice visit with her. And then as you're leaving, you're walking down the hall and the nurse comes to you with this somewhat, it looks like a pile of, of laundry. And she <laughs> says, I'm sorry, Mr. Dinos, these are all your mom's underpants. Natalie in room 702 steals them at night. <laughs> she kept complaining that this woman was stealing her underwear and I kept saying, come on, Nobody's stealing your underwear, and there she was. How did you come to the conclusion that nobody was stealing your underpants? Well, I, I didn't. Uh, the conclusion was based on why would anybody steal somebody else's underwear? Well, what you don't realize, and maybe because you're the son, how wonderful your mother's underpants were. <laughs> we started at Yuck Yucks together in Toronto, and that was always the talk amongst That's the right. comics. That's, That's right. Ludinos. Does, what's his act? I don't remember his act, but his mother has the most glorious underpants <laughs> of anybody's mother at the club. You know, that's- Do you think of Yuck Yucks? What? Do you think of Yuck Yucks every once in a while? There's a I cross- just did. Your, it, no. what, that's a that's what? That's a common thing. What? Uh, stealing people's underwear. Like I know when I was in college, you- <laughs> <laughs> What do you mean it's a common thing? No, it is. When I was in college, we had communal laundromat, you know, where mm -hmm. we went down to wash our clothes and you could not leave your laundry in the machine unattended because usually they your underwear would be gone. It's stolen. Who steals somebody's underpants? Especially? Or at least when I was there in Santa Cruz, there was an underwear thief at Cowell, the college at oh. UC Santa Cruz. Okay. Yeah. Well, I the mean, the report is in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe TikTok could get on that case. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Why I is mean, Jackie outside? What? Why is Jackie outside? COVID. Okay. Um, we all know boring people, right? I know a guy who's so boring. He went to get elective surgery, and the surgeon told him to call, count backwards from 10. The surgeon fell asleep. Are we holding for a laugh? You have the applause button. Give him oh, the applause oh, button. The, this is, that one is... Uh... Yeah. <laughs> A lot of people go to the clubs to try out new material. Lou decided Lou to come here. Lou just comes here, here yeah. and tells me. No, he phones me. It's always psst, followed by. He's got the funniest jokes. Lou Dinos, if you have a chance to catch him. Uh, you're very kind. Is, uh, is there a place coming up soon? Do you have a date coming I'm, up soon? I'm, yes, we're currently working on getting a spot at Flappers. <laughs> <laughs> Keep your fingers crossed. He might be at Flappers, which is a, a, a great place. Great in place. Uh, I work out there. I know. In Burbank. And, and any given night, you can see Leno and Arsenio and Leno's amazing. Jim Jeffries. I haven't and, seen him do stand-up in years. I haven't seen you do stand-up in years. But. I was over at, uh, at Flappers the last few weeks. Oh. I, I go to Supernova. Where's that? It's uh, in Hollywood at oh. Whitley and Hollywood Boulevard, and it's outside in a parking lot. And that makes me feel a lot safer. You're talking to a guy whose daughter is not allowed in the same room. She doesn't have COVID. No. Oh, well, you, my you son is sick. Why are you outside, Jackie? If he's you put not on wearing, your headphones, no, he does not wear headsets. He's no, not sitting near the not. mic. It's, he's just eating chips. I know. It's just the guy who joined us. I love the episode where you guys have chip. Where you had that guy come in, the guy who bought a pencil, and he was just eating chips and coughed, <coughs> coughing. I, cough I shouldn't be the one sitting I know, outside. You're outside. He's in here. I coughing. feel a lot safer. He's a smoker. Here. Look, look up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. Okay. Yep, it's a plane. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> he hasn't gotten a spot at Flappers, so he looks at this podcast yeah. as his Flappers. As you yeah. said, people show up in places to try out their material. Yeah. He, this is how comedy works. People just sit at home. What was that? <laughs> a drum roll. Oh. I make people laugh one at a time. Now. When you thought of walking in here and talking to me, <laughs> why did you go grab a bag of chips? I wasn't expecting to talk to you. I wanted to come by and hang. 
And, and, oh, not in this room and not talk not to me. Not necessarily. You want to go eat your chips? No, I'd rather talk to you. But... Closer. You leave. All right. Anyway, All right. you're not talking. Do you want? Do you want because to talk it's about important it? to visit friends every once in a while. I hear you, Jackie. I, I hear know, you. Go ahead. Hear Act me. like Lou's not even here. <laughs> Go ahead. What do you have? Lou? I had a bunch of stuff to talk about. Go ahead. Today. Well, number one was. <laughs> Go ahead. Number one was the TikTok thing that you just skimmed over. Oh, you said there, 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 because people get high from those cans of whipped cream, right? So TikTok is, TikTok is hosting ads for whipped cream, but it's actually nitrous oxide, and I don't think that. TikTok but that's knows. a big. That's a claim that you can't make. It's on Vice. It's an article on Vice. Doesn't mean read. it's real. It, it's real that they're hosting these ads without knowing what the ads are actually for. Oh my gosh. What does that mean that they're hosting ads? I don't so know. anyone could put up an ad on TikTok. Like you yeah. could put up a sponsored video, right? But don't they go through it and see what it is? I know, but I don't think they know what it is because it's advertised. Oh my God. Go ahead. It's advertised. Why don't you finish your it's thought? Advertised as whipped cream. Like I can show you the ads. Maybe I could send them. I don't know. I don't want to be involved in that. I like TikTok. I'm I don't think TikTok is doing anything wrong. I don't think they knew. So it's what is problem. Vice claiming? That they're. Oh, I can't talk. I, I Why? Can't it's like grossing me out. I have to take off my headset. What's grossing you out? The sounds are grossing me out. Go ahead. And I guarantee you, you are not number 25 in Croatia anymore. That's why I keep saying 30. I knew that after this episode, I would be 30. I can't. You can't what? I can't listen. I said to Lou, come over and have some chips. (laughs) You're actually licking your fingers. It's so gross. Grease off the chips. No, n- no, you don't put your fingers in your mouth. Well, how do you lick your fingers? By not don't putting them in your mouth? my fucking hands. You don't lick your fingers. You don't lick fingers. Who Stern. licks fingers in this day and age? He licked his fingers. Stern, aft, hull, steerage, mast, or all poop bu- dick. I got a mouth like a damn sailor. <laughs> Is it is it good? Is it good? <laughs> what are you laughing at? I can't do this episode. Why? Because it's gross. The sounds are grossing me out. Every time I, he can't hear me talk, so every time I start talking, <laughs> he goes on to the next joke. He's not wearing a headset. No, I know. He doesn't like to wear headsets when he's eating chips. Uh, can I tell a sad story? Yeah. Go ahead. I I. I have a step ladder, right? Because my real ladder left me. <laughs> <laughs> this is not my ladder; it's my step ladder. That's a good one. That's actually a really that's good a really one. Good I take one. that one's the one that's got to go on the top. All right. All right. Go ahead. Um, I will now give free sage advice. Uh. Always infuse it with butter and use it sparingly. Actual sage. <laughs> sage. We get sage. it. Who's doing that? Does That's Jeremy. Right. Jeremy. Jeremy. I never knew we, we, this is like episode 30 or 40. We've never heard this before. Never did you just sound put it? Effects. We never had that one. Jeremy, where did you get that? Or well, Alex? I, I found it on the soundboard. Just now? Yeah. <laughs> How come that, with all the jokes that have been told and all the things in all the episodes, Lou brought it out for you, right? What did I bring up? He's oh, you can't hear it. He- it can't he's, hear not it. He's, he's not wearing headsets. He doesn't know. But that's smart. You come on a podcast. Right. You can't hear a fucking thing. That way, you're, there's no spoilers. That's so right. when this actually is uploaded and you can listen to it. I'll be surprised and entertained just wait like till you hear the else. Right. And wait till you hear the joke about it's not my actual ladder. It's my step ladder. That's going to be a good You can do that every time, Alex. We say step ladder. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Is there another one? I think All right, so. I'm trying to find a good one. Okay. <laughs> well, you have a list of not good yes, ones? These yes, are the good ones. Yes. Okay. When it comes to stupid, Howie, I tried and tried to write the book.
<laughs> Go ahead. You know what the better part of valor is? I don't know what the reference is. Valo. Okay. I don't even, I don't understand. There's a cliche, the better part of valor, bravery is the better, courage is the better part of valor. I never heard that cliche. Oh. If it, a cliche kind of connotates that every, you know what everybody says. What did they say? <laughs> 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 I've never heard anybody say that the better part of valor is, I don't know that one, but it may be right. And maybe the military, our military uh, uh, men and women of service who are listening to this podcast are probably roaring over that last joke I with was, their valor. I was born with a silver spoon in my mouth. It took my parents six years to pay for the spoondectomy. <laughs> Go ahead. You write these, do they just come to you? In, in yes. Area? Okay. Um, uh, I was born with a with a fork in my mouth, which is <laughs> which is exactly the same thing as being born with nothing in your mouth. Wait, what? <laughs> that's, rather than a rim shot, that's a great ending to everything he says. <laughs> that the audience goes, "Wait, what?" <laughs> <laughs> Go I'm gonna, There's I'm other gonna, buttons. I just don't know what they do. Personal? Well, press one after press this after, next after. after this next joke. Go ahead. Wait, a tell little, the joke. Something and he's, a little personal. One of, one of the biggest secrets in my life all these years is that whenever I said three, I actually meant four. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> that was by accident. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is a secret revealed yes, on this podcast. Right. So if you're just tuning in now, uh, gotta, and I don't know how that happens on a podcast, if you could just tune in <laughs> 10, 15 minutes show. in, I know. But this is Lou Dinos, who's a, a, a very uh, wonderful- You wouldn't know it. You wouldn't, you wouldn't know it. No, this is, what they're doing is we're watching the sausage factory. Oh, good. Well, that, that sounds bad. Just two guys in a room talking is we shouldn't talk about the sausage factory, but I'm just saying, because my daughter's out in the other mm -hmm. room. Um, this is, <laughs> oh, Alex, that wasn't a joke. <laughs> Anyway, um, and you should try a, a lot of the other buttons too. But and, and after the jokes, but you are a, a, a very funny comic yes. who was on the road with me for many years, and now oh, you are trying. You're going through your iPhone because, okay. like me, I write down stuff, and it makes no sense to me. Right. I want to hear what's in your iPhone right now. On my material yeah. thing. Okay. This is this is my material. Jeff Ross is coming in soon. Do you know Jeff? I love Jeff. Me too. Ew. Talk about jokes. What's what? I just keep watching the thing. I know. You keep get your fingers out of your mouth. Keep your fingers out of your mouth. <laughs> okay. Um uh, <laughs> can you understand yours? Not really. Here's the thing. Oh my god, since COVID, uh -huh. <laughs> we've been pretty much you do everything online. You can do your meetings online, you could shop online. You can learn online. Next thing you know, there's going to be porn online. <laughs> that was such a good one. <laughs> All right, I, I love that the, the whatever the rim shot is always funnier than the joke here. Go ahead. I'm looking forward to Halloween. Because right. Because now I can wear a mask. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Okay, here we go. Let me see what I got here. Um, a lot of these are true stories. Yeah, like I, I can't remember. I can't remember if I was in a Quicksilver or Footloose. <laughs> Do blind people ever experience love at first sight? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here's something you don't know. I told about. you the one. Did I tell you this? My wife. My wife. In you the guys are just, it's just like nonstop dad jokes. <laughs> it is. Well, here's one that's from your mom. So in the middle of the night, one night, mom took gummies. Yeah. You know, and she wakes up. I was sleeping. And she wakes up in the middle of the night and she goes. Oh, is this marshmallows? Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Why don't you just. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. I didn't hear it. She woke up in the middle of the night really seriously. And she goes, what the fuck is a marshmallow? I go, what? Like, what the fuck is a marshmallow? I go, I, I don't know. What What are you asking? She goes, I know what cake is. I know how to make a cake. I know what cookies are. I know what popsicles are. What the fuck is a marshmallow? What is it? 
<laughs> That's just somebody who was a little buzzed at three in the morning asking a question. So I went on every night at Supernova Comedy and asked that of the audience. And? You can same response as here. <laughs> <laughs> Silent. Oh, well, uh, and crickets. I didn't have the crickets. Fool me once, shame on you. Right. Fool me twice, shame on me. Right. Fool me three times, shame on you. Fool me four times, shame on me. Right. Fool me five times, <laughs> right? Shame on you. Yeah. Fool me six times, shame on me. Right. Fool me seven times, right? I think you know where I'm going. This is the best. Shame on me. Once bitten, twice. Uh, Removed. Shy. No. Twice. Valor. It's something about Valor. No. Once bitten, <laughs> twice. <laughs> what the hell is it? Once bitten, twice shy. Twice bitten, thrice shy. Thrice bitten, thrice shy. Thrice bitten, five, five ice shy. Five. five ice bitten, six ice shy. Seven ice bitten. I think there's a lesson there, Howie. Fool me 16 times. <laughs> this is for sure the best episode. Really? Yeah. I love no brainers. <laughs> They're right up my alley. You Is that a line? Yeah. I love no-brainers? Yeah. I love no-brainers. When people say that's a no-brainer, I love those. It's right up my alley. <laughs> <laughs> Are those all the sound effects we have? Just like sparkles? I don't know. Yeah. This is a uh, We're out. happy We're happy out. Uh, uh, Hanukkah day, or uh, as I like to pronounce it, what? Hanukkah. Why do I even plan shit for this podcast? You got stuff. You should do I your stuff. stuff. Don't let this stop you. I got good Jackie. stuff. I got really. He's got good stuff. <laughs> like oh. The Okay. You don't know this. Can I okay. just say this? My yeah. mother was a fighter. <laughs> I didn't know how much of a fighter she was until the Dermot Sinclair fight. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. That, was, that joke was the best thing since sliced bread. What's oh, Dermot Sinclair? Yeah. What is that? That was a real fight. Oh. <clears throat> I like when they say the best thing since sliced bread. Me too. Because you're setting the bar really low. Like nobody ever goes, wow, you have sliced bread? <laughs> this is even better than that. <laughs> Are you kidding? They Slice should... fucking bread? They took bread and they sliced it? They should say the best thing since the it's wheel. Even better than... Right, the wheel is the like wheel. amazing. Yeah. Whoever came up with a sliced bread? Yeah. It's not even just bread. It's the fact that it's sliced. Like they had bread, right. but then once you slice it, Fuck, that's amazing. <laughs> it's going to sell like hotcakes, this sliced bread. What, you're close? <laughs> did, you did you just end the... Yeah, it's the just button. another button. What? <laughs> it's just another button. I know, but that's the button that ends the show. You ended the fucking podcast. Uh, I'm over it. Oh, you don't want us to tell any more jokes? Yeah. I like the jokes. You do? Yeah. Are you asking me? <laughs> Nobody's talking to you. You're not wearing a headset. You're just eating <laughs> chips and reading your book. I have a. I, have I think it was for, a legitimate whipped cream show. ad. It was. Yeah. No, yeah. it's not. Only... I'm gonna send you the. First thing. of all, I love TikTok, and I know that they are very. Um, they really do put up flags when something isn't good more than a lot of the other platforms. I I don't believe that either. I'll send it to you. It's not <sighs> like from the Onion. The well, Onion is fake. Here's my idea. I just bought a uh, crotchless T-shirt. Oh, that's good. That's good. That's a good one. All right. This is the quiet parts of this uh, podcast. Well, but you, in the meantime, it's bring hard to keep to that you. level up. No, it's not. I can talk about. <laughs> you can talk about. Do you want to talk about Ted Lasso? I love Ted Lasso. Yeah, I'm. Then just he, he won all the Emmys and. Yeah, or I wrote. About Seth Rogen calling out um, COVID. COVID at the Emmys. That I would have just said goodbye. <laughs> I know, but he came out. That wasn't planned, right? They no, came and said it was think... supposed to be COVID safe and that it was outdoors. And, and then he loved that he had the closed tent with the roof, he said. And it's more important for you to have three chandeliers than to make sure that Eugene Levy doesn't die of COVID. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, can I give out a comedy tip? Yeah. Is anybody if, asking? If you're doing comedy, I, I want to give you a comedy tip. Let's okay. say, right. let's say, for example, you wanted to tell a joke about the number eleven. Why? A great place to start mm -hmm. is the number nine. <laughs> <laughs> Why not ten? <laughs> Work yourself up. Well, he's he's the expert. Yeah. Well, at, she asked you. She, oh. you're not wearing a headset. She said, "Why not 10? No, because uh, <laughs> Jackie. <laughs> 
If you've never been on a stage, that question would be so silly. <laughs> There's no such thing as a stupid question. There is no stupid questions. No. <laughs> anyway. You know that joke about the the guy that, that, that this is not my joke. The guy the guy uh, is want, looking for the wisest man in the world and he has to climb up this this mountain to get to the top of this mountain to see the the smartest man in the world and and he, it takes him years to get there and he finally gets to him and he and he stands in front of him and says Still. He says, uh, uh, can I ask you, can I ask you a stupid question? And the man says. All right. But well, thanks for that story. The, uh, the, <laughs> the man, no, that doesn't. Don't finish. The man says. You don't have to finish. There's no such thing as a stupid story. And he says, in that case, forget about it. <laughs> and then he goes all the way back home. Do you want to hear a good story? Yeah. I heard. Okay. Yeah. Hello, um, I'm going to need everyone to go to the OBGYN immediately, and I don't like to give advice, but I'll give it, um, because you don't know what's going on up there. I stopped in on the way to work two days ago um, because I woke up and my boyfriend's dog, Fluff, uh, who he thinks is a sweetheart, was licking me in an inappropriate place. So now my biggest enemy is named Fluff, and we don't make eye contact, and it's hard to be mad at a dog because people think you're mean. Anyway, I stopped in the, uh, the clinic about two days ago on the way to work, and they say, we don't do walk-ins. And I go, I'll walk right in because we have a situation. And I just think I have an infection probably. So all of a sudden I'm in there, doctor's putting her gloves on. She goes up there, and she goes, something's in here. And I go, I don't really care for the small talk unless there, you found a baby in there. What's going on? She pulls out a soggy piece of paper. I go, did you lose a tool up there? She goes, I don't, none of my tools are paper. So then... It's actually a note. She starts reading it. I go, pass it here. Um, and I can barely read the writing because it's been up there for about 43 years, um, my age. And uh, it, it's from my birth mom. It goes, from your birth mom, I didn't want to give you up, but I didn't have the funds for twins. I kept your sister. We're going to need you to come to Texas. We miss you. Luckily, I have Miles. So I fly to Texas, and she only said her name was Mary, so it took a long time to find her. Lots of Marys. I met one enemy, one close friend. I end up finding her house, and she's passed. Oh, my God. She passed away. But she left gold for me in the backyard. There was another note on the doorknob. So I'm digging for gold in the backyard. Her neighbor comes out with shotgun. He goes, get out of this yard. Our friend died. I go, this is my mom. Let me get the pussy note that I found. My OBGYN found it, I promise. Um, and I showed him. And the point is just go to the doctor because you could have an STD. You could be pregnant or you could have a note from a loved one. Hello. Oh, that's um, amazing. Yeah. That's that a, is a good, that's a public a service. Message. It is. Good message. What's her name? Um, Holmes Holmes. Holmes Holmes on TikTok? On TikTok. Well, that is a good message. You know, usually we do uh, lighthearted material, but that is a good, uh, solid um, accounting of an experience that I think a lot of people share. Mm -hmm. um, I once put a note in my, you know, in my rectum. You know I did that, right? Mm -hmm. I told yeah. you. Yeah, but tell everyone else. <laughs> so um, I go, I used to go once a year to the doctor for a physical. I didn't, I was remiss in the last couple of years because I didn't want to go to a doctor's office. And part of the checkup for a male is a prostate check, which I find incredibly uncomfortable and awkward and... You're weird. Okay. So <laughs> I... Uh, I put a note in there, knowing, just wanting to be in the room. So the, I bent over the table and the doctor put on his glove and he oiled down his finger or whatever he does. And then he sticks it up there and he, oh, oh, I hear him, oh, like that. And he pulls out this little crumpled up piece of paper. Yeah. He goes, what's this? I go, what do you mean? What's that? You're checking. What the fuck is that? And uh, he opens it up and it's just a list. It says, pick <clears> up <throat> milk read everything and i just go fuck that's where it is <laughs> there's no button on that no button so you Thank know you. i've come up with a tv show idea and you know how you borrow you're always borrowing from other ideas mm -hmm. i have a cop idea one cop's name is fender headshun the other is pitch ford the third they are known as fender headshun and pitch thordenberg 
like Starsky and Hutch, but with one exception. <laughs> there. They're Fender Headshot and Pritch Fortenther. So you just, you're going to take the old Starsky and Hutch scripts and change this. Which one is, uh, is Starsky Fender Hopton? Fender Headshot. Fender Hedgen. Yeah, that's Starsky. That's Chris Starsky. Wardenthorp is yeah. Hutch. You know what, what you should do? Idea. You what? should actually pitch that, sh- like put one of those hidden cameras like on a pin and go pitch shows. Bad shows? Like, bad shows. I've done that before. <laughs> really? Yeah. You've done on bad purpose? Shows? Yeah. You know, we did bad shows. I did this show called How We Do It. <laughs> and a big... But that was a real show. What? You didn't pitch it like it was a bad you know show. No, within that show, oh. we had hidden cameras. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not telling you I pitched a shitty show and it turned out to get sold and it yeah. was my show. <laughs> Your very first special, if I could just say, I don't know why you never thought it was funny. Your very first one where you walked into the jewelry store and said, Herb sent me. Remember the name of the. Yeah, that was a, a Carne- uh, from Carnegie Mall. Live from Carnegie and you're Mall. On those, you're on the treadmill and you're, yeah. you're just testing it out. Yeah. That was all very funny Thank stuff, you. Howie. Thank you. Well, let's rewatch. You should rewatch. I will. But I, I could just see the captain of I want to do remakes of... I, I, I would like to go pitch... Re, you know what I used to do? I used to call my agent all the time. Chips are finished? Are the chips finished? <laughs> <laughs> now it's your turn to try to talk while he's eating chips. Yeah. Um, I remember calling my agent, I would say, you know, I'd call my agent and say, you know, hi, it's Howie Mandel. I saw Black Widow t- uh, last night, you know, and I'm trying to think of a, the, you know, the guy that ran the, the control center that she went into? I would say this to my agent. He goes, no, no, I didn't see that. I'm just telling you, I would be perfect for that part. <laughs> so he said, okay. Is there any way you can get me in for that? I saw the movie last night, and I'm telling you, <laughs> I could kick ass. You give me that part, and I will just skyrocket my, skyrocket my acting career. And it was really funny when you hear the agent, not knowing whether I'm just insane. There's no TV cameras, so he's not on a TV show. <laughs> and he would just say, well, it, it. just clarify, you saw the movie? Yeah. And you, you, you want to be the part that, was in the movie yeah well how do i do that i go that's that's your job i'm not gonna tell you how to do your job you just get me that part i know i'm perfect for it you want me to put it on tape you want me to make a tape and you'll say he goes howie the movie has been done and then it gets like kind of serious i you can't be in a movie that you're not in when you but i saw it and i'm perfect for it right and i would just and finally he go oh i gotta go to a meeting and there's no meeting but he would just hang up on me and my wife would always say who is that joke on like now you just somebody who works with you and is 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 there to try to build and help build your career thinks you're an idiot i remember you would call your agent when you went on an audition and say to them i'm in hollywood can you make me a star (laughs) <laughs> I'm in Hollywood. Make me a star. That's you. Did you finish your chips? Yeah, I did finish my chips. Oh, so can I, I could just imagine the wait, captain. Wait, uh, uh, my guest is here. Okay, yeah. imagine the captain of the of the police station saying, "Fenden Thorpe and Thorpe and Ship, get in here." Love that. Take your chips. All right, take Thanks. your chips. I Jeff will. Ross is here. Mr. Wait, Ross. before Jeff Ross. Well, Jeff Ross could come in too, and we could talk to him. But I have to let you know, I'm watching like I'm watching the Gabby Petito case like a hawk. And right now they're on live with the pathologist breaking down the autopsy. Okay. I don't need that right now. I just finished the chips. Okay. Never mind. No, no, no. We'll do that. Okay. I'm just saying if anyone wants to watch, I'm busy right now, but if anyone wants to watch the update and let us know, they're live. No, by the time this, they see this. What? The autopsy will have been out. No, I know, but I'm interested personally. Come on in, Jet. Oh, Okay. He's stretching. <laughs> I love this guy. Hi. Hi. Come on in. Right Sit here? down. Yeah, middle seat. You guys middle have seat. matching hairstyles. Yeah, we do. Two Jews, two bald Jews. What is this, Spirit Airlines? Middle seat. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. What, you don't like the seat? <laughs> no. You want a more comfortable seat? No. My, 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 my daughter gets really mad at me. Hi. Because I, I talk ad nauseum about these seats. Are they famous seats? Yes. There's do you know what you're sitting on? No. The, the <laughs> plaque on the the armrest on the end. Let's see the plaque. Read it, read it to me. I don't have my glasses. These are the front row from Johnny Carson. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Wow. So these are the front row from Burbank, from from when they tore, you know, they bought, they wow. sold they sold the building, 
and then they tore down the, the and nobody was taking keepsakes. So I took almost everything. <laughs> so you're I, saying that Buddy Hackett farted in this seat? No. Oh, an audience member. An audience member watching Buddy Hackett <laughs> farted in this seat. This Amazing. is the audience. That, you know, you sat on a, uh, when you're a guest there, you sat on a couch or you mm -hmm. sat on a nice easy chair. The entire audience, this was like stadium seating, and he would go up into the audience and do stump the band and... For and, a germaphobe, uh, those seats are probably filthy. Probably, but I'm not sitting in them. Only yeah, guests. Only guests. <laughs> so only By guests. today's standards, they're beautiful, the blue, and... It's a part of history. I feel very uh, honored to be. I love that, and I and you should be honored, and I'm honored to even have it in place. That it, the uh, and I'll, I do this. My uh, my my daughter gets. Where's the so, booth from? Center <laughs> booth from Caesar's Palace, the wow. original Caesar's Palace center booth. He asked. I didn't even tell him, but that that's the original when uh, they signed Celine Dion to do. Uh, they tore down Circus Maximus, which was the main showroom. And uh, and then they built the uh, whatever that's called. Where does she play? It's called the uh, forum. The forum, yes. Hi. Hi. <laughs> and uh, my daughter, her son has a runny nose, so I won't let her in the room. She I usually see. sits here. I see. But she has somebody with a runny nose. And I know it, it is a little off-putting having her behind me, but <laughs> it's fine. You're off-put by my daughter behind you. Um, uh, where where's the the milk crate from? Uh, the the that piece of wood. Yeah. Oh, that's just from the other room. <laughs> Why do we have that? There's no story for that milk crate. Where's that deal or no deal sign from? <laughs> <laughs> I gotta say that you are one of the funniest guys, and I've known you since you were like a kid, right? Uh, yeah. How old were you when we started working together? <laughs> working together is very generous. It was charity. You what? gave me a gig, uh, or Rich did. One of you guys did. Um, I was probably in my 20s. It's got to be 25 years ago or something. Yeah. Are um, you 50? I'm 56 this week. Oh, happy birthday. Thanks, happy brother. birthday. Yeah. Wow. And you're, and you're doing better than ever. Would, would you ever dream as that 25-year-old comic that at 56 you would be so in demand, everybody would know your name, you're still working? He's on the road right now, not only with himself and his own concerts, he does. Dave, he works with Dave Chappelle. Yep. I just saw you, was it in the last week you were doing Bumping Mics? Yep. Dave Attell, I yep. love Dave Attell. That's gotta be, I've never saw, and you know, uh, my daughter went to see you live with Charlie Sheen. Oh wow! A, she saw Atlantic you City. at the Borgata. Mm -hmm. That was the first one. Really, it was amazing. It wasn't the Borgata. It was, it was the a, the convention center. Oh yeah, it was a convention center. No, it was in a. It was in the. Oh, maybe I don't know. Well, I don't know what, what I what, 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 that was the that was a, a monumental moment um, in my roasting career because he'd been bombing on his torpedo of truth tour for weeks. Is that what he called it? Torpedo of yeah. truth. Yeah, winning. Yes. Winning that whole thing when right. he had Tiger blood, right. and I didn't know him. I didn't know him at all. But I was um, at a party f at Jimmy Kimmel's house, a uh, big Hollywood party with George Clooney for Howard Stern and all these people. I was there. You were probably there. I was at that one when the first time that Howard Stern came to town because I remember Clooney was there. Yeah. I was at that party, and uh, I remember um, I had a, my uh, my girlfriend at the time with me, and uh, uh, and she fainted when she met. Uh, John Stamos. <laughs> <laughs> George she, Clooney was there. Uh, Howard Stern was there. But John Stamos made her... Uh, made her faint. Out of... Uh, good. She loved it. She loved it. And so thought, Uncle Jesse. Uncle Jesse made Ronnie um He's my neighbor faint. now. He's a very good guy. And Bring he her by. He lives right by... Yeah, she, you can watch her faint again. You're not with her anymore. No, but we're still good friends. Right. Well, she came too. She finally came too. Okay. I got a phone call from Charlie she I had gotten some feelers saying... You know, they might want you to show up at the Charlie Sheen tour. This is, you know, whatever it was, 15 years ago, probably 10 years ago. And uh, I said, well, uh, for me to get on a plane and go to roast him in an arena like that, I need to know he wants it. Not the promoters want it or his man. Like, he needs to call, ask me to roast him. Because it's a big deal. You got to right, prepare. Right, absolutely. 10, 11 o'clock at night, cell phone rings. It's Charlie Sheen. Jeff, please, I just made you a reservation, 5 a.m. flight or something to, to, to Atlantic City, to Philly, whatever. Can you, so now I have to leave the party, write jokes on the plane, write jokes all night. I'm delirious. I say I need, all I need is a, um, a rolling podium and a hazmat suit. 
and I write jokes all night. I, I don't even meet Charles. I meet him briefly. Chuck Zito, his bodyguard, like says, don't go too hard on my boy, basically threatens me, puts a fist in my face. So now I'm like, I got all these crazy Tiger Blood winning Charlie Sheen fans. Uh, I, it is Jersey where I'm from. How do I do this? So he starts bombing, and when he would bomb, he would throw money back at the audience, like refund. He'd throw hundreds out like it was chaos. It was insane. You remember. It was insane. I've never seen anything like that. And I've been to comedy shows and stuff like that, but it was not like a comedy show. It was like nothing I've ever seen before. And that's what I was going for. I knew it was going to be very different. She was, flew from here to yeah. see that live. She flew across the country. I go, where are you going? Her and her husband. They went to a, a Charlie Sheen concert. And I walk out when he, start, uh, he starts going south. You remember this then. Mm -hmm. And I had a hazmat suit on and I rolled out a podium and I said, hey, my name's Jeff Ross, the Roastmaster General. I got some applause and I go, I heard there was a bomb scare. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm here to, to remove the bomb or something. And I roasted him and it went so well. You know, he's like, get on the plane, you know. And, and he I was just, good. He was a good. He was very gracious about it. And we wound up doing like 10 or 12 of them. And by the end of it, I was like, why don't we just do this on TV? And I delivered him to Comedy Central on a silver platter, and the rest is history. By the time we did those dozen tour dates, I had 20 minutes of material about Fantastic. Charlie Sheen. Have you done every roast that Comedy Central ever did? No. I missed a few um, a long time ago. Oh. No, other people were producing them. And did you I, do the Trump roast? I did. I produced the Trump roast, and I roasted Trump. You produced Trump. it, right? Yeah. And you roasted it. What was that like? Um... At the time, he was just a funny New York character. No, but here's a, the, my question is, you know, in the vein of a roast, you you have to be, like you said, like Charlie Sheen, you got to be okay with it. You got to know what it is. And it comes from a place of love, you know, but it can be hurtful. I don't know. I I, I don't remember seeing the, the or I it don't. It can't be hurtful. I have to disagree. What? You say it can be hurtful, but... Well, the wrong... You have to take it. You have to have a good sense of humor about yourself. But what I'm saying, if you don't have a good sense of humor about yourself... Then you then, shouldn't say yes. But do you, does Trump mind... He, he doesn't seem like the kind of guy that would take a joke. This is one of the most debated things about Trump, is why would he agree to be roasted? You know, does he have a sense of humor? I believe that his sense of humor or lack thereof evolved when we roasted him a couple of times so he evolved into no sense of humor i believe so and wow. i confronted Usually him evolve <laughs> evolution is you would get a sense of humor right during <laughs> wouldn't it? you would think you would soften up but power made him more rigid when i first roasted him um i guess the second time for comedy central you know the situation was there and snoop dogg was there and it was like a famous you know, New York moment where 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 uh, he all his friends and family, Melania was in the they were all there, and Greg Giraldo went up and just you know wiped the floor with the place, killed. And I see Donald is just stone faced, not not you know just staring, right? You know, pretending it's not funny, right? And I went up to him in the commercial break and I said, um, whether it's funnier to you or not you need to react so that we don't just cut to the audience laughing at you. You need uh, to be in on this. If you're having fun, everyone will have fun. He looked at me, he kind of nodded, he kind of got it, then he was fine. But the, it, no, because then he's laughing because you told him that that will look good. He's not laughing because he thinks it's funny and taking it. Wrong. I think he thinks it's all funny, but thinks it's funny for him to act to like laugh. it's not funny. Ah. I think ah. vulnerability was not in his brand. That so makes smart. sense. That's kind of like you don't have to turn around and break your neck every time I'm I love talking. it. It's Sorry. great. <laughs> but like that makes sense looking back at his apprentice show and everything like that. It was very serious and it was he was the boss. I think that was his brand. So maybe that's what he was kind of going for. As I well. believe that's true. And there were things he was more sensitive about, you know, he didn't like jokes. I said, I read your book, The Art of the Deal. Why did it have four chapter 11s? <laughs> and, you know, jokes He made like, it known that he didn't like that? No, that was all fine. But apparently he told, you know, it, it was out there in the writer's room that that stuff was bothering him. And he was always fudging the numbers whenever they put, 
his net worth in a joke or something like that. He would fax back a bigger number and leave the joke as it was. But, but make me, I have four billion, not three billion. Right, that trouble. kind of stuff. But that's, that's hysterical that he would do that, but that's not self-awareness. I believe everyone loves to be the center of attention even when there's a target on their back. And I think Trump epitomizes that. However, not everybody. When he, big stars. Oh yeah, people who are in this business. Big yeah. stars. Right. Ego. Right. Even if it's negative. I don't ever think roast is negative. No, you're saying people like it. Uh, it's attention. It's done from a, an affectionate place, as you know. You. So you think you think Harvey Weinstein is enjoying all the attention? No, I don't think that's right. <laughs> I think that's different. Yeah. I think if someone says, if someone consents to be ro consents to be to be roasted, then they're got to be down for whatever. I, I want everyone to leave a roast going. That was so much fun. I want to do that again. And you're smart enough, or you're as the producer and as the, the the star of the you are the roast master general. You're smart enough to know that the the key to us being able to accept it first and foremost is the roastee to be able to accept it. And I, if they're I, enjoying it, but if they're not and they're getting hurt, it's death. That's right. And I only saw that once. It was with Tra Chevy Chase, and I wasn't at that roast. I had nothing to do with that roast. But when I found out later that they didn't really introduce him <clears throat> to the roasters and stuff like that, <clears throat> sorry, it really bothered me. And I, I think that that's why that one went south. But with Trump... What do you mean? Do they know the jokes before? No. No. So what do you Even mean? Even the other roasters don't know the jokes. Right. So what do you mean he had to be... He had to meet the roasters. He had to... Greg Giraldo... I said to Greg Giraldo afterwards, he said the roast went really bad. I said, well, what was... He, he, said, he said that Chevy seemed out of it. He wore sunglasses. He showed no vulnerability. He complained he didn't know anybody and his friends weren't there. I go, well, you know, and, he, and they said, and he never looked at me and they never acknowledged me. I go, what do you mean? Well, didn't you meet him at rehearsal or at dinner? Like when I produce a roast, I have a dinner for everyone the night before. Oh, so it's like the uh, like the old time, uh, what's the club? Uh, Friars Club. Like the Friars Club. Right. Yeah. You want to look someone in the eyes before you call them a motherfucker. You know, like you want to have some human contact. Right. And he didn't do that. And, and, and at least Trump, like he would shake everyone's hand. He would thank everybody. He got what was going on. Right. Not only that, he came to the Friars Club roast every year. He'd watch me roast other people. So when it got to him, he kind of got it, even though, even though he pretended it wasn't funny. Then when he got into politics, I, I, I spoke to him a couple times while he was president about this. I would always, he'd always want to talk about, you know, uh, whatever's going on in the world. And I'd always bring it back to- Wait, he called you to talk about what's going on no, in the world? No, I saw him. Oh, you saw him, yeah. Yeah. And I'd always bring up Joan Rivers and Don Rickles and try to remind him where he came from, that he loved that stuff, that he was in the, in the hospitality business. He was in the, the show business. People, we all worked for him. Right. I flew down to Mar-a-Lago on his plane and made fun of him in front of his- I worked friends. at Mar-a-Lago. Of course. Yeah. It was a great gig and yeah. he was very generous. He walked me to the uh to the mater to, to the to the manager of Mar-a-Lago. I said, "Take care of Jeff, whatever he wants." They handed me to the keys to a Cadillac. Me and my buddy got to, you know, float around Palm Beach like big shots all weekend and Trump, you know, I'm not saying, you know, he was the warmest guy, but he had that thing that my dad had, that caterer, that that thing where he wants to put his arm around you and go, you know, like, this is a good guy right here. You know, how'd you get such a pretty lady? You know, take care of this guy. Like, he's always wingmanning and always right. making sure everybody's okay. And I think that's part of why... What changed? I think power and the fragility of his ego. Instead of having every... People always say, like, what did Trump do for the common man that they would vote from? He entertained them for decades. And suddenly, when it wasn't at, when he wasn't getting the the love all the time from certain groups of people, I think that tripped him up and made him recoil. And I said to him in the Oval Office, I said, like, you know, you canceling this White House. I said this in front of the director of the CIA and his national security team. You know, they were waiting for him, and he. I somehow found myself in his office. Uh, and I said, you know, like you canceling the White House correspondence dinner, it's not just not healthy for democracy. It's not healthy for you personally 
to, and your crew and your staff here, you all look so stressed out. Like the world will be a better place and your lives will be better if you have a moment of levity every day or every week. Like people need to be able to talk to you the way they always talk to you. And this job doesn't have to be uh, uh, so intense. It, laughter, it truly is therapeutic for you. And, and what did he say? He took it in. He listened to me, but nothing changed. Wow, that's nervy to say that because you don't know how he was going to react. I knew he wouldn't take it well. Um, he was very, he, it was. So a, you just would sit in the Oval Office and talk to the president? No, I, I was invited there um, for lunch once. Um, I was there another time. For, Were you afraid to be invited there for lunch and then, you know, uh, being part of Hollywood? And I'm not asking you what how you vote or anything. Right. I, don't, I don't care about your politics. The, the thing is that that would be polarizing in the way that, uh, who, who, who was Ellen sitting with? Was Ellen sitting Bush. with him? Yeah. When Ellen was sitting, yeah. When Ellen was sitting with Bush, there was like huge hoopla right. in, you know, the, the Hollywood community. And they did that to Chuck Schumer when he talked to Kellyanne Conway at a wedding. And, and, and you know, like in other words, at a certain point, and comics are really good at this. Like I make the same jokes in front of liberals as I do in front of conservatives. Right. You know, it, comedy brings people together. And if you can't confront your- But were you not afraid that you, like there'd be a, a picture of you in the Oval Office? There was, and you know- And did it hurt you? I, I, it, it, it didn't, there wasn't a picture of me in the Oval Office. It's hanging on my uh, wall uh, with uh, other uh, various politicians and war criminals. I have every single, <laughs> you know, I love having everybody from, I have I have a picture of me with the Obamas and the Bidens. I have a picture of me with Bernie Sanders. I have all the mayors I've met. I just like that stuff. I like that being a comic is a backstage pass to the world like that. I have a picture of me and Donald Rumsfeld, who I often think was despicable uh, in, in the way he handled Iraq. But there's something about this little kid from Newark growing up and getting a hug from all these people that sort of gives me, del delights me. So I, I hang them all up. But to be in the Oval, you know, one time I, I, I did post it right when Trump got in, I ran into him at a golf course and he was trying to get me to the, come to the uh, inauguration. And I kind of didn't want to go and I made an excuse and of course in a weird way you, you could have went there to be you would have been a roaster you could have roasted I could have done it all <laughs> that, that it, it, everybody who got involved with Trump got chewed up and spit out but I do sometimes fantasize about how did I become friends with a guy who became president that did nothing about it? Like it kind of eats at me and I see you laughing like you get it yeah you know it's like it's never going to happen again it's not like I mean <laughs> David Tell you don't know you don't know <laughs> if you would have told me sarah silverman called me and said how can you post you know post a picture of you and trump he's like hitler and i said he's not like hitler and if he's ever like hitler you'll be glad i'm friends with him <laughs> <laughs> that's brilliant you are brilliant you know uh, people Thanks. know you for your uh comedy and for your roasting and that i watched you on i can't remember what it was on somebody's podcast kind of recently talking about in, uh, the documentary that you did about going, you went to uh, Iraq or, yeah. or, yeah. And your, I don't know where they can download it, but they should, but your talk about what it meant to you and your fear, you didn't want to go. Yeah. And then you saw what it was and you ended up shooting this documentary yeah. was one of the most moving, touching, wonderful moments I've seen come out of anybody you know and what it meant to you to be able to go there and entertain and kind of what was going on in the moment in real time in your mind from inside the plane it, it was it was a beautiful beautiful dissertation yeah. on an Thank experience you. that a lot of and and it just the light bulb went off because you're talking about the experiences that you have these as life a adventures howie and i know you have a million of them i was like floating through life and you know you get to a certain point where you go all right maybe i'm maybe i found what i'm gonna do but maybe this is sort of the, the ceiling on it and is it all worth it and wh what am i really negotiating here like you know free drinks at a club and is my name spelled right and and buddy hackett my mentor died suddenly and i was a little lost i was a little lost we close to buddy i loved very, him very I, I didn't know him I, I know uh, sandy 
but I, I, I didn't know. Buddy him. and I were like mentors, not right the word. We were almost like brothers. We were, we're both ageless. Where'd you meet? We met in an elevator at the Friars Club. You know, he was one of the funniest. Uh, Whenever I heard or saw the listing that he was on Johnny, I would never miss it. He was the best joke teller, the best storyteller. You know who hates? That's what. I, first time I met him was in an elevator. I was going to play poker uh, with Elon Gold up on the uh, fifth floor of the Friars Club in New York, and Greg Fitzsimmons and and uh, Buddy gets on it, and I'm like, oh my god, Mr. Hackett, this is such an honor. If my parents were alive to see me meeting you, they'd really be failing and this and that. And I shake his hand and he shakes my hand. And he says, you know who hates farts the most? <laughs> Midgets. <laughs> That's all he said to me. <laughs> and the door opens and he leaves. <laughs> and then a, a year later, he saved me at a roast. Milton Burrow was heckling me relentlessly. Now I'm like doing the roast and Buddy kind of came to my rescue and he gave me his phone number. I didn't use it for a year. Finally, I'm in Beverly Hills, and then we became uh, where we talked every single day. He was like my morning orange juice. I'd wake up to an answering machine message of a buddy, either asking me how I was or just doing a funny joke that he thought of that day. And we just became, you know, I wound up giving the, the eulogy at his funeral. We were very, very tight, and I still talk to his wife, Sherry, all the time, and I call her on Mother's Day and stuff like that. But um, when he left, when he left the world, suddenly I really felt like, what the fuck am I doing with my life? Like, I didn't have a wife and family to, like, fall back on emotionally. I was really alone. And that's when Drew Carey, who I'd, you know, done various writing jobs with over the years, said, hey, you know, I'm putting together a little squad to go to Iraq. This is in 2003. Uh, the early days of the American occupation of Iraq, they take it over. Saddam's still alive. He's shock and awe. Shock and awe. And I called it Operation Enduring Diarrhea because... <laughs> you get sick over there? <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> it was, this is rough. And uh, Saddam's Revenge, they called it. But, you know, I don't think I fully understood the job description of being a comedian until I was able to go over there and entertain people in uniform, making a joke... Um, penetrate a, a a Kevlar vest or a helmet. Like, I thought the government and the military was the same fucking thing. I had no idea. I didn't know veterans. I didn't know anything about the modern military industrial complex. I just, I didn't understand that they were volunteers. I didn't understand that they were um, mothers and fathers and ethnically diverse and way more sophisticated. The army... Military people are way more sophisticated than you would think in movies. You see war movies, there's a lot of knuckleheads and, you know, they're like gung-ho. But when you really meet the military, they're just engineers and doctors and, 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 and truck drivers and electricians. And it takes a lot. And I really found like a crowd that wasn't drunk, that wasn't obnoxious, that was there to laugh. They weren't there for date night. Facing death. Facing death. Even during the show. Exactly. You know, a helicopter goes over or you hear an explosion nearby. My hotel room got mortared while we were out doing a show and still went back and slept there that night. And I still do these shows. I, I went to Alaska last Christmas uh, with Seth Green, my neighbor, and we, we did a, a little comedy routine and a handshaking tour. And just on uh, a couple weeks ago on 9-11, I performed on the USS Iowa down in um, Long Beach for uh, Afghan war, Afghanistan war vet, American war veterans who served in Afghanistan. And, An amazing guy. And Thank you. And it's a little bit that I can give back. It's more than a little bit. It really is, the fact that you're there. And I, I, I truly, you know, believe that laughter is the best medicine and you are out there as one of the the giants, a giant pharmacist of this medicine I love that, that we give. Um, let me, so, here, so I hear, okay, I love that you said that. Here's what I've been telling myself, and now I see it with the crowds, because I see you out there working on your stuff. You know, comics, we go to the gym. Right. You know, laughter's the best medicine. We've all heard that, Howie. And people go, well, how can you still do it with cancel culture? And let's go, I go, that's all bullshit. If laughter's the best medicine, would you ever want your, who wants their medicine watered down? You want your medicine potent, name brand, full dose, and, and, I, I, and it's I working. Well, I agree, 
but it 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 works um in front of the audience i do personally have a fear of getting canceled and you you walk that edge even harder because an insult could be taken out of uh, context or even uh, not that that's something that you even care about but even referring to somebody as a different prone uh, the things that they're looking at now or the things that you or i might have done 15 or 20 years ago a tweet a video something a sketch we were in right it could come up and then you're just canceled do you not think about that or you don't give a shit i do give a shit because not because i'm worried about getting canceled it's more because I don't like to hurt people's feelings. That eats at me. The roast master general says, yes. which is interesting. Yes. I, it, it, when I hurt someone's feelings in a rare occasion that it gets back to me, it eats at me. And that's what keeps me up because I really do try to find the line. But even as a single guy, yeah, you know, dating, you know, you could- You can't ask anyone out. That's over. What do you mean? Women have to make the first move. They have to- Guys are, I can't. I don't know how to do it anymore. So a woman, if a woman wants to go out with you. They, she has she to f- tell me or she has to flirt. She has to tell me something. Oh, okay. And it's and it's really a problem. It's really hard. And what about you misreading uh, what you think is a It doesn't signal. happen because I'm not doing it. I just can't. It's just too scary. I can still have my swagger. I can still be charming. I can still try to be funny and try to get someone to like me just like I always did since I'm like, 13 but as far as crossing the line to that first kiss or like can i get your number i do think it's a woman's world now and by the way bumble is the most popular dating site i'm not on it but women tell me that's how they like to meet guys on bumble women have to choose it's not a it's not a democracy women it's women's but i'm not talking about a date it's just like uh you know, without mentioning names, there are people that have gotten close to being canceled from what I would consider a bad date. Right. Or a mis uh, calculation of what they thought was a signal. Right. Which happens. It's just two people who don't really know each other. And you think that's what they meant. On another note, just changing direction. It's fun talking about this stuff. It I, is. I, 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 I love sitting down with you and being able to air it out. Well, I'm really scared. You know, I'm scared because I happen to be on what is considered and i love my job there at, at america's got talent but it's a, you know it's a broadcast network and it's ad supported and so i am i feel like so fucking stifled all the time you know it's and even because you're on social media and you're popular on social media and that's where most of this shit goes down as you know if you're at uh, a comedy club or you know a, one of our pop-ups outside right Nobody gives a fuck what you say. You could right. say Queen Elizabeth is the biggest cunt in England and everyone will laugh. If you say that on social media, you're going to get fired. It's yeah. not a good room. It's just not a good room. Social so media. I stopped putting comedy on my Twitter. I just stopped. I was like, this isn't a good crowd. But you were doing comedy. You were doing roasts on Instagram. Live. That's a good crowd. That's fans reaching out going, please roast me, it's my birthday. I am in the hospital, I just had surgery, please roast me. It's our anniversary, let me have it. So that's a good crowd, but right. for some reason, Twitter, not a good crowd. Wow. In the beginning, you remember, we'd write a joke and you'd see you got a thousand retweets and this is such a, and only- Look what happened to Gilbert and, on, twi- on Twitter. And, and those were people who were angry who don't follow him. Bro, I know. How can you get mad at a joke that you're not at? If I do a joke at the comedy store and someone at the improv gets offended, what world are we even in anymore? Uh, you know, my, my little theory there is that the company that fired him, you know, wanted, he, they were probably paying too much money. Yeah. They looked for an excuse to get rid of him. And they have the exact same character that sounds exactly like Gilbert still. <laughs> and that's probably somebody just working for scale. Don't you think? I got the call right when Gilbert, Gilbert's a good pal of mine. I just spent days with him and his family in Florida on the beach. Isn't he great? I love Gilbert with all my heart, and I love his his wife and kids. Um, I got an email. I got an audition to audition for that fucking duck that he got <laughs> fired for. And I sent Gilbert the email. <laughs> you sent Gilbert the email. Of course. I go, Gilbert, I'm going to take your job. Of course, I didn't even audition. But it just made me crazy what hypocrites they were. They're going back to another roast comic? 
for an audition after what they just publicly hung him out. The they made him apologize to get paid and then still fired him. It's amazing. It makes me crazy. But that's that's scary. From the time that I started, you know, the um, the safety net was a joke. It's a joke. Like even if you weren't in this business, if you said something and somebody turned around and they were offended by what you said, or you might be getting in trouble, the the safety net was. I was just joking. I was joking. And if you if if they believed that it was just a joke, it was okay. But now they take the joke as hard as they take a direct bullet to the between the eyes and that's not what it's meant to do it's meant to diffuse those bombs it's meant to take the pain out of life and it's like that's not funny you can't joke about that of course you can well there's never too soon there's never but not in the world of comedy in you know amongst us and there's nothing that's off limits there really isn't there is to the public to the general public but really real comedy comes out of tragedy and darkness. When when 9-11 happened, I remember being in New York and it was a big thing that and Dave Chappelle and his wife and baby evacuated the Soho Grand to my apartment in the village. And we were very distraught. Like, what are we gonna do? Is comedy over? Within 24 hours, we were like, do we need to cancel the Hugh Hefner roast? And I called my manager at the time, Bernie Brillstein, a comedy legend who'd seen it all. I thought, I said, Bernie, like, how do you, what do you think's gonna happen? And he's like, I don't know, kid, I don't know. And when the old guys don't know what the fuck's going on, I start to go, wow, we're in new uncharted territory here. And of course, New York's resilient, the world's resilient, and we all started joking within a week. But, and by the way, there's a great documentary on Vice right now um, called too soon comedy after 9-11 i gotta check that out you'll love it it's all about that time <clears throat> gilbert did the did the joke at the friars club well, right you Within know we the did the hugh hefner roast and and i was a producer on that show so i had to write a letter to the friars club to Hef, and to comedy central saying um you know we wanted they wanted to pull the show no one wanted to fly in from la the the venue needed to, to know what we were doing and uh, was this appropriate? And we were supposed to have an after party. And I said, let's take the after party, make it a fundraiser for the Twin Towers Fund. Let's put on tuxedos, go to the Hilton, and do the show. And if you don't do the show, the terrorists win. And that was not a cliche back then. It really meant something. Like You were the first person to say that. I, fe <laughs> I felt like that was the first event that was like a real... Because Hef, Hugh Hefner, everything the terrorists could hate about America, free speech, sex, you know, Hef, you know, maybe that's the epitome not, of was America. Was the epitome of all that. <laughs> I don't know if the excess is the right word, but let's America. call it freedom. Yes. And, and it wound up being a cathartic fundraiser for something that was important to us. So I think comedy, be, besides just making us feel good, it can actually like do good in the world. How many times have you gotten stopped, Howie, and someone said, I was in the hospital, I read your book, or I was I was going through a breakup and I watched you on TV. Like, that's what a comic is. I love that. And that and that cheers me up. I, I you know, I I uh, my I, my psyche settles in depression. So, you know, I need like when somebody comes up to me, and that's why I like being kind of recognized or somebody saying, you know, I was going through a hard time and, uh, you know, you made me laugh and my mom used to watch you on Deal or No Deal. Every, that just makes me feel good and that kind of brings my spirit up. But, you know, sometimes I want to, I would just want to give it up because I've always used humor myself. You know, most of my comedy was by myself. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why I like pranks. Right. Because I, in school, was always doing things without an <gasps> audience, without friends without telling friends hey look what i'm gonna do i'm gonna go walk up to this guy and i'm gonna say this or i'm gonna <laughs> drop the chocolate bar in the pool no, or when gonna... you froze when you used to freeze and then people would walk by like a museum like in a, I don't, you did this one where you just you saw. said i did something to you 
Oh yeah, you got me good. What did I do to you? <laughs> you don't even remember. You have so no. Many he told me because I saw him the I saw him the other night. Uh -huh. I saw him the other night. We were at Supernova, <laughs> and I was saying that uh, you know Lou, who just you know Lou Dinos, who just yeah, walked yeah, yeah. out of here. So Lou used to be my opening act right. at the beginning, and I fucked with him so bad. I really did. I've apologized well, over and over again, Lou. If you're still here, I, yeah, I'll give you another bag of chips. You have to, <laughs> so here's what uh, Howie, king of the pranks, but I'm like. A deer in headlights. I'd never really performed in a theater before. And all I knew about you was that you once made Todd Barry go into some trap door. <laughs> you know, he won't let me, he won't let me show that video. I have it on video. I, I mean, it, 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 <laughs> I'll just, I'll just for the listeners. So Todd, Barry, I, I played in Todd around, Barry. I saw him the other day. Hilarious comedian. One of the funniest guys. And it was at, uh, it starts with an L it's in New York, uh, uh upstate New York. Uh, um, it's Mark? a city in upstate New York. They, they have theater in the round there. Okay. It was a theater in the round and we walked in for the sound check and it's a theater in the round and the, the chairs are all around and, uh, he says, how do we get to the stage? And I said, you, you just walk down this aisle and you'll go to the stage. You know, it's like the Westbury, you know, right, it's, it right, looks right, like right. that. Right, right, right. You know, you just, and uh, are you leaving now? <laughs> I have to pee. I didn't want to interrupt you, but I have to pee and I'll be right back. No, we'll wait. Oh, no. Wait. Now she's going to make me have to pee. You really? No, I'm, I'm okay. Peer pressure? <laughs> so, so My sister says I'm a panic peer. I always have to pee right before I'm introduced to the show. Is that true? So I need, I need, I, I almost like. Wear adult diapers. Like David Tao and I, we do our bumping mics. Yeah. And he, he's always right smoking a cigarette right where the exit door is when the opener's on. And I'm always like right near a bathroom because I have to pee right as I'm being introduced. It's fun. Then we enter from different sides. That's hysterical. <laughs> Every time. Just because you're afraid you might have to pee, you bring it upon yourself. Yeah. If you have to go pee, feel free. So um, I was just going to, so Todd, and then Todd said to me, because I wasn't thinking of, pranking him. Todd said, so when I say goodnight, do you still come up the same aisle? I go, no, you go through the trap door. <laughs> he goes, where's the trap door? I said, I'll have them show you after. Anyway, go to your dressing room and fill out whatever, right. some paperwork or whatever right. they want. So the pay goes to you. So he, uh, he went to the dressing room and I went down to the, to the, uh, stage manager. And I said, is there a, any part of the stage? Does it open up and go down? And he showed me there's a door, you can open it up. And with theaters that are in the round that revolve, that's where they plug in all the speakers yeah. and all the thing, that's all the electronics. And it's only about two and a half feet deep. <laughs> you know, it's not really deep. It doesn't go downstairs. But I said, here's what I want you to do. Then do not mention it in front of Todd when he comes out. But when he does his show, first of all, before he does a show, take the door off so to leave that hole there, okay? And then when he says goodnight, I want every spotlight just to go to that hole. And that's all I need, okay? <laughs> and Todd goes, how am I gonna, yeah, we're going on in five minutes. Todd I goes, was this put together? This oh, it was, brilliant. and I have it on video. Rich, we have it, don't we have it? I was gonna show it on my talk show and he said, please don't. And, th and then what happened is he does this set. It's in front of like 3,000 people. He kicks ass and he goes, good night. And the crowd goes crazy. And all the spotlights go down to this little door. And he goes, good night. And he steps down <laughs> into the hole. Oh, because he said, I said, you're going to go down there. As soon as you go down there, then bend down, knock, and the guy will let you all the way down to the stairwell. He goes, okay. So he does his great show. The crowd's roaring. He goes, good night. The spotlights go to this hole. He jumps in the hole. It's up to his thigh, you know? And then he ducks down so you see the back of his back. And all the spotlights are just on the arch of his back. And the crowd is, like, the, the applause has died down. And then they open the house lights saying there'll be like a 15 minute intermission and they're just looking around and the guy they just enjoyed for half an hour is sitting like hunchback in this hole. And every so uh. often you can see him, his head pops up and he's like looking around in panic. Nobody's answering. Nobody, I'm knocking on the floor. Nobody's answering. People are just wandering off into the lobby. He was in there for like, how long was he in there, Rich? Maybe 10 minutes? See, this is where you and I are different. I was tell, I was like, let him off the hook. Let's let, and you're like, nope. House lights, let him stay in there. It was like 20 minutes. <laughs> and, then, and then you see him finally just stand up and one step out of the hole and then wander up the stage wow. with a he was so angry. But and I feel bad. I do this shit all the time. And then I, he didn't want to be on the road with me anymore. So then there was you. 
He couldn't take it, huh? Uh, Howie. And then he and then he came up to us in the dressing room. He looked at Howie and he goes, "There's no there's no trap doors there." <laughs> did, he, did he have a sense of humor? Um, yeah, I think yeah. he did, but I think he was really embarrassed, and I felt bad. He didn't feel he didn't. I don't See, know. That's th a difference. You will play pranks for yourself, and you don't care who it's on. No, if I do people care. Get mad. I, I, do, I do care when they get mad, but in the moment while I'm doing it, I don't know that they're going to be mad, and I don't know what to do when they're mad. I say I'm sorry, and. Lou has been the, the the recipient of a lot of these. Mine, mine, mine. I wasn't humiliated in front of the audience. Mine was <laughs> was a strict thing between you, me, and I guess the crew, and I guess Rich. Um, I was very young in my career. I'd never really done a theater before, so um, I'm on stage, and you know when you're that nervous, and it's like. It's a. It's also like an opportunity, you know. I'm probably making more than I usually make at the clubs, and we roll into the theater. I guess I must have been at sound check, um, and you know how he's a big star. You know, like this is a huge, few thousand seat theater, and it's an off night. It's like a Monday or something. So you're filling a theater on an off night. And I go, what's all this? Do you have an orchestra? And the stage manager says, no, that's for the rest of the week. You know, like Carousel is per play here or whatever show was. Guys and Dolls was there. So there's a full orchestra <laughs> behind a curtain and that the audience is never going to see. <laughs> <laughs> have, it's not even ringing a bell. It's know. not even a funny story. But I go on stage. <laughs> how can how can whatever follows yeah. your reaction? How can it not be funny? <laughs> the fact that it's not funny is making me laugh because you can't even get it because out. Because it also taught me something about myself, like keep calm and carry on, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I'm, now I'm on stage and I'm doing my act, whatever the fuck I talked about back then, right? Right. <laughs> you know, waffles, New Jersey, you know, uh, but growing up in the cage, just my little cute, like, you know, I wasn't the roast guy. I had no, no I had none of that attack mode i was cute you were an adorable little jew with a full head of hair <laughs> with a jew fro yes. that that would make uh any uh any 70s basketball player jealous uh -huh. and every time i got a it, it was a reward every time i got a laugh a big laugh which was you know every couple minutes i'd get a big laugh not constantly but when i got a big laugh so that the audience just was loud right on the laugh there'd be a, a, a huge gong noise right behind my head. <laughs> oh. Do you remember this now? No. no. Do you remember it, Rich? You know. Well, it was you on the gong. Well, probably. <laughs> I did not know that till right now. <laughs> I assumed. But so every time I'm like, punchline waffles, and the audience would roar and then come right behind my head so the gong is a foot behind there's a curtain i'm in front of a curtain and then a gong and the audience doesn't hear the gong because they're laughing on right. the left right. but what they do see is me <laughs> me flinching like i'm about to get hit with a <laughs> every time there's a round of applause you're like this yeah <laughs> So I'm never killing this hard. I've never killed this hard because it's like this big theater show. But I'm also like, there, you know, uh, uh, I don't know what you'd call that. Like, Tourette, uh, uh, you know, like I turned into like wild and crazy Whoa. guy. On the <laughs> Two guys walking into a bar. Whoa. <laughs> and, you know, I, I have no idea because I didn't even see the gong beforehand. Right. So I have no idea. I, of course, I get off stage. I walk around the back and you guys are standing there with a gong pushed up against the curtain. <laughs> You just found a gong and put it. There was a gong there, so I just pushed it. There's an orchestra hole. What's orchestra. really interesting is I learned, I did a lot with Lou too, that the, the juxtaposition of being able to be behind a curtain, right behind a comic, yeah. without them knowing, and to be hide uh, through the anonymity of a giant laugh yeah. was hysterical. We did one, and it, it wasn't me, which we had a comic also opening for me. And right on the setup, in the middle of the setups, one of the guys, one of the stage managers, would just stick his bare ass out the out, <laughs> out the curtain, so that, that he'd be going. You know, I'll tell you something. I went on a date, and it was a first date. 
she looks at me and she says, and then you'd hear the audience go, whoa, wow, like they're singing ass. <laughs> and it, like, but we did it the whole act and it was off. And he got off stage. I go, how are they? He goes, you know, they're responsive, but they're weird. <laughs> He had no idea. He goes, they don't have a sense of timing. You're going to feel really off out there, Howie. They do this weird thing, and it's not even like laughter. It's just, whoa, that was, whoa, this is going to be good. And I just let him describe that to me, and I always felt like that was going to be. <laughs> so so in my case, I, I honestly think that I learned that I can pretty much concentrate through anything. But we have to. Listen, and then you end up going to a, a war-torn you know, camp. You prepared me for war. That's what I was doing. Thank you. That's exactly <laughs> what... On behalf of a grateful nation. <laughs> Thank you. Aren't I, I'm a giver. And people don't realize when I give yeah. that it's the gift. <laughs> it sometimes hurts. Yeah. But it's worth no pain, no gain. No, it was it was it was a perfect uh moment. And uh But we I remember you doing really well. You're 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 softening up how you did. You No, I did that. fine. I did good, but uh, you know, every time I got a big laugh, it reminded me of my bar mitzvah. You had a Be gong at your bar mitzvah? No, I had a canter. And 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 he would you know, when you're at the was it the Bima, right? So the canter's behind you. And you're the son of a caterer, right? Yes. And the my canter God, your your bar mitzvah must oh, have. Oh, I had the bar mitzvah of the century. But the canter would poke me in the ribs every couple of minutes to keep me from when my voice would quiver to like keep me from getting too nervous that, that's that's <laughs> that's calming that's a calming it wasn't a, a, a it wasn't but i don't know why he did that <laughs> and what does it do you're going uh, oh no i, I think he just did it a little oh. just to keep me present or something the only other person to do that was milton burrow on my first roast uh um he did that um he would poke, but, he poke but with me. his dick. <laughs> <laughs> he poked me in the ribs to bring it full circle, and it was so annoying that I finally started going after him and making fun of him. He was known for having the biggest dick in Hollywood, wasn't he? He did have the biggest dick in Hollywood. I what, saw I'm it saying once. he was. You saw it? Yeah. What? You've been to the Oval Office and you've seen Milton Berle's dick. <laughs> yeah. How did you see Milton Berle's dick? Um, we were at the Friars Club, <laughs> and I think he wanted me to see it before he died. Oh, that's was, so touching. It was very touching, and I felt really... Uh, he said that to you? Not in so many words. How? He, what words did he use? I got to pee. Could you help me? <laughs> <laughs> so I help him. He's in a wheelchair. No, he then. said, I got to pee. Will you help me? Yeah. What was your... What was your... I was like a, you know, I was a sweet guy that would sit with him for hours and eat a no, sandwich. No, no, I he, know. I'm not He saying. told me about Fidel Castro sending him cigars and shit like that. No, I get that. But if somebody said, I have to pee, would you help me? I wouldn't yeah. know what, like, what is, what was your job? You would job? say no. I probably, yeah. oh, so I'll get somebody. He was in a wheelchair at yeah. the time. Not because right. he couldn't walk, but for his cock. It was. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes he used his own personal cane. Sometimes he used the chair. So, but did you have to unzip him and pull no, out? Did no. you, ha did you handle his dick? No, no, I peed. Next. I think he just wanted someone there in case he The fell. buddy system. A buddy system, like a spotter. And you were able to pee on, like, at the... Milton Burrow's going to pee, I will pee. I will you pee. just said that the same Girls thing. Girls do that all the time. No, but he, you did that to him. You know that. When what? you said you had to pee... I his, almost went. Yeah. He I'm almost sorry. went. He's, he said he's a pure... He, a pee, paddock peer. But paddock I, can't, I can't hold it because I've had kids. So... You, you know, you got to do it. more kegel. Kegel, I know. Yeah. I have do you do kegel like a son? No. Never? <laughs> no. You got to do it. I got to get my... My vagina has got to be tightened up. I don't think it's your vagina. Oh. Is it is Kegel Kegel your your vagina? No, I think it's, it's muscle. the muscle it's in, muscle. and I think that they tighten it up to, to, because what happens is those muscles are loosened when you have a child, and therefore sometimes when they laugh they pee, or when they sneeze they pee. Oh. So if you have trouble holding in your pee, I don't know that this is right, but you oh. do Kegel exercises, oh. and as a man, so do them so while you're here. That's feel where the expression comes. It wasn't a dry seat in the house. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> How was, are you feeling? I feel good. Let me finish. I got to finish. Go ahead. He's peeing next to me. <laughs> okay. And Milton Berle. He knows it. Yeah. And I'm now I'm, I, you know, I helped him up and just make sure he's okay. And while he's doing it, I'm peeing. And he leans back just enough to show me that it's endless. Wow. Endless. Wow. His giant 90 year old penis. It's like a fleshy rainbow. Wait, even flaccid? I think he wanted me to. My yes. daughter's had it. Yes. Please. 
I think he wanted me to know how big it was because we were roasting. Um, Can Jeremy animate that? <laughs> we were roasting <laughs> Joe Torre, the Yankees manager. Right. And, you know, I wound up having firsthand account of how big Milton's famous penis was. How big do you think it was? Um, it had a warning track. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was gigantic. But you think he showed it to you? Oh, for sure. That was his famous thing. I'll take. Let's have a a, a big. I'll take dick out the other Did half. he did he look you in the eyes while he leaned back? Um, I don't think it was that weird. It yeah. wasn't predatorial at it all. It wasn't that weird. No. It was Just like, it come was help a, me. I want to show you my dick. That's like the worst, most fucked up gender reveal party I've ever heard about. <laughs> <laughs> he also taught me how to smoke cigars and taught what me. What do you mean taught you how? I never smoked a cigar. Right. So what did you start with? His dick. <laughs> What did you? What do you mean? He taught you how to smoke. What He's is like? You don't smoke cigars? And he, and he, and he, you know, he, he, he took a, a cigar out that he said Fidel Castro sent him for cigar. Christmas. Wow, you know, because he would play Cuba back in before it the, was illegal. Yeah, and he took a cigar out. He stuffed it and held it in his nostril. <sighs> And this and is the guy that taught that's, you that's how to. Taught you. And he that's inhaled it. He inhaled it, and he said, "If it smells like shit, it's Cuban." And then he took that out of his nostril and put it in my mouth, and he lit it. And I've been smoking cigars ever since. That's the worst fucking story I've ever heard in my life. For a germaphobe, it's the best. For anybody, you don't have to be a germaphobe. That's not how somebody would be taught how to. He stuck it up his nose and into first, your mouth. First yes. he saw his dick, then he took a cigar, stuck it up his nose. Is this all the same day? No, no, this oh. is over the course of a couple of years hanging out. But why, didn't it bother you that it was from his nose? It, it was amusing. It was shocking. But at this point, it was probably the greatest show business. It, it was like... When people think of show business stories, it's not like from your nose to my mouth. I, don't forget, I was the young guy in the steam room at the Friars Club listening to these stories. What they, happened in the steam room, Jeff? <laughs> well, let me tell you about Henny Youngman. Uh, no, I worked kidding. with Henny. Henny was, he was so great. funny. I he only got great. to meet him a few times. You know who I hung out with when I first moved here? Did you know oh, Dean Martin's uncle? What was his name? He came to my... Uh, he had the crazy legs. He was always at the Dean Martin roast. He was Dean Martin's uncle, crazy legs. He, lived, he lived in the Hyatt, yeah. Did you want a more comfortable chair? Are you uncomfortable? You want a more comfortable? No, no, no. I'm good. I'm good. Okay. Uh, a comic? Yeah. He lived in the Hyatt on Sunset. Dean Martin had a comic uncle? Yeah. He, he never really made it big, but he was on his thing. He did that crazy leg, rubber leg dancing. He was on a lot of the roasts. Dean Martin's uncle. I'm going to look it up. Tell a tell a, a, a story that will be so, that the audience will be so. Leonard Barr? That's him, Leonard Barr. Do you remember Leonard Barr? No. You don't remember Leonard Barr? No recollection of this person. He was very funny. He was like a Henny Youngman. He was a, he was like, but he, and he was, I, I got to know him just from the roast. I watched all the Dean Martin. Were you a fan of the Dean Martin roasts? Yes. I didn't know what that stuff was when I was a kid. It was only after they asked me to do the roasts in the late nineties that I went back to the museum abroad. You couldn't YouTube anything back then. Right. So I'd have to go to the museum of broadcasting to go see what the roast format really was and how far you could go. And they asked me to roast Steven Seagal and I didn't really care about Steven Seagal. But when I looked up the roast and saw, oh, Milton Burrow and Red Buttons and Henny Youngman and Buddy Hi oh, this I can get behind. These guys I can, this will be like Mount Roastmore. I'll be the right. young guy. And my buddies downtown, they all made fun of me for hanging out with the old guys because that was, they were all doing alternative comedy, cool, hip comedy. Oh, the days of Largo. Right. And I was like, you know what? I'm doing the most unique alt comedy. I'm going to put a tux on or a suit and go hang with these old guys. And no, and I love it. And everybody loves it. And you don't have to be in the in crowd to get it. You know, right. anybody can get it. And that's what I love about. And I, I think that you invigorated Comedy Central. Comedy Central itself, I don't think there's anything that, uh, maybe South Park and the roasts mm. are the two things that people think Cor about when they think about Comedy Central. So Cultural, it, it, perennial yeah. moments. Yeah, and those are the moments. And whether you're poking fun at, at uh, Donald Trump or- Bieber. You know, or Bieber. Was he good? Was he good? Uh, Bieber was the, a rare, a rare time when, you know, because I'm on all those talent calls for years, 
It was one of the one times where Bieber called us. Really? Scooter Braun, his manager, said, Justin wants to get, and I'd mentioned it to Justin one other time or something, but he was, he had a big album. He knew, he had a great album that hadn't come out. They knew they had something great, but they had a PR issue. Right. And Justin's talked about this and Scooter's talked about this. And Justin has personally thanked me for this moment because he had just gotten arrested. He'd gotten in trouble for different dumb teenage shit. Right. Stuff you do when you're 19, 20, 21, and you got all the money in the world. And he needed like a reset, like a re like when your internet's out and you got to turn it off for a minute and turn it back on. That's what he needed. He needed to own it all and do something where he accepts responsibility by taking the jokes, taking them well, and then having a really good, funny, self-aware, sincere rebuttal. Right, and that by design, I took him. We, we, you know, we went out for lunch. We practiced. Like we, he really cared, and he volunteered to be roasted. He really wanted it. Did you help him write his rebuttal? We did. The team did. Yeah, I did. I wanted to. I heard the sincere part. He ran, and I've never told this before, but I didn't want to hear his jokes. I wanted because I knew I trusted the team to take care of him with the comedy. I wanted to hear his owning it. Mea culpa is not the right word, but I wanted to hear him own his childhood, his juvenile behavior, and then man up. And I worked on him on that part. He had it handwritten in a notebook, no handlers, no publicists. He really did it from the heart. He really can write. And then he wanted to talk about me. He said, Jeff, are you seeing anybody? You'd be a great father. Like He was a very sincere beyond his years. And I think the roast really like did that for him. I think so. That was his comeback. That, I, said, I think that was his comeback. I said, Justin, everyone's been pointing their fingers at you lately, but that's mostly just lesbians telling the barber how they want their hair done. <laughs> <laughs> that's brilliant. I feel great. That's I know fucking... you asked about why I'm coughing. Like uh, I had, I had, I had the Delta COVID. variant, and I, I got the vaccine, and then got COVID. Like, you know. And that was rough, you it was, told me. It was rough. I saw you right after, and you were gracious not to run away from me and ask me how I was feeling, and I feel great. No, but you told me that you got a cough. You thought you were, you were leaning up against the counter. You thought your ribs were... Right. It felt like, you know, the beginning of Rocky too when they're in the, uh, they can't, their ribs hurt so much. And um, How long did it last for? I think I was really in pain for about five, six days, and then... You know, by the 10th day, 11th day, I was back out on the road. Chappelle called and said, come to Florida. And I just couldn't be in the house anymore. And I tested negative. So, right. I, so and I went. When you finally get rid of COVID, Florida is the place to be. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the worst part was probably um, I lost my sense of taste. Still? I'm going to see Dave Matthews band at the Hollywood Bowl. <laughs> <laughs> that's a joke dave i love you <laughs> did you lose your taste and i smell? did i lost taste and smell and and does that come back did it, it come back it did come back because I, I think some people here we have a couple of people in here that are not vaxxed does that bother you i mean at this point i think enough people are either are lying about it any i'm all you're always around non-vax people right all we can do is take care of ourselves and assess our own risk you have to assume when you're going in anywhere that people are not vaxxed right so many of my friends colleagues are not vaxxed sometimes it's for good reasons and sometimes it's ignorance but well i think w w w an ignorance is a good reason to um <laughs> But no, these guys are smart. They're just, uh, you know, everybody has a different uh, opinion. Right, Jeremy, <clears throat> oh my Seth, Kyle? <laughs> I'm all in. I just got my 17th vaccine shot. <laughs> yeah. Here's what I'm going to do right now. Here's what I'm going to do right now. And they got the, because they hang with my son and everything. I did this once before, but I'm going to do it from now to the end of the podcast. If three of you say, if the three of you say, okay, I'll give you 50 grand. Wait, just say it, or they actually have to do it? They have to, well, say it and do it and go through it. $50,000 on the table right now. To get vaxxed? Yeah. yeah. 
Come on, they gotta say yes. He's, no, he offered it before, and they said no. But but no, Jeremy wasn't there. I offered I offered it to Seth and Kyle. Jeremy wasn't there. Ky I don't know if they. Kyle, uh, you'd say yes. I offered uh, Kyle the other day five grand. He didn't say yes. What? So I'm saying they could split the money any way they want, but it's got to be uh, the offers off the table at the end of this podcast. I'll give you fifty thousand dollars. I guarantee you. I promise you. If you say right now that you will be vaxxed and you do get vaxxed, you have to get vaxxed. Talk about it, and we'll continue this, and hopefully what's by the, the end. What's the debate? I mean, what's the debate? 50 grand for something that you're going to have to do eventually anyway just to go to a fucking ball game. Well, they don't have to. Eventually. Why? Because you might want to go to shows. Or might I be think, this is what I think, and I'm not saying this about them, but I think that people who have a, um, whatever their reasoning is, um, and uh, for not getting the vaccine, will get fake ID and make their way into a places. lot of people are doing that right so what's the point so they'll find ways to get in it's it's not about getting into free or not getting into free it's whether you want the vaccination or not it's also whether you want fifty thousand dollars or not why do you care that much that you would offer up fifty thousand dollars to be honest with you, you want me to tell your you what? son my son <laughs> yes that's why but it, he's vaccinated i know but he's with us uh, but here's here's what happened this guy was vaccinated and he got sick because he was around somebody who wasn't vaccinated at one of the shows. And it's sick. I, I mean, I was sick, but I could have gotten fucking, I could have been dead. Dead. Yeah. We'd be talking about me and Norm. Oh, my God. That killed me. Did it? That killed me. Do you have a Norm story? <laughs> I could talk about Norm all day. One hit me the other day that he was so fearless. He didn't give a fuck who he pissed off or. I'm in the hall. I got two good Norm stories. Good. You'll love this. So SNL, he would invite me every now and then. Norm MacDonald passed away just last week. He was a good friend to all the comics and and revered. So anyway, he used to... My, my, I know him since I'm a beginner. And my first comedy club gig ever is in Catch a Rising Star, Princeton. And Norm MacDonald, this is 1990 or 91. Norm's done a few uh, local talk shows in America, small time, but he hasn't made it in America. He's kind of got a little following, and but now he's starting to headline in America at comedy clubs. This is at a time where in New Jersey, if you weren't telling dirty nursery rhymes wearing a leather jacket, you weren't really interesting to anybody. But here's Norm, this goofy Canadian accent, really telling these long, weird bits for eight shows. And he probably bombed three out of eight shows. Whenever he killed, which was, he would kill, when it was a sophisticated crowd, he would get him and he would kill. He would just go backstage, he'd pull out a deck of cards, and he'd make me and Rich Voss play poker with him. When he bombed, Norm would go to the exit and say goodbye to every single person who left. <laughs> <laughs> Just to be weird and make us laugh and be awkward for the people. He would thank everyone for coming after Are he bombed. You serious? He was such a nut. I love that. That's a committed person. <laughs> I love, but that's what I loved about him. He was him. just grasping fame and figuring out how to be who he, to be different. And, and also one of the nicest, most genuine, authentic people. I've been watching over and over again. One of my favorite <laughs> moments of, of his is in 1998, in January 7th, if you look it up, January 7th, 1998, he did the Letterman show. That is the day that he got fired from Weekend Update. Right. And he wouldn't say anything negative. Uh, Letterman did many, many times to him in his face. But he, he, first of all, he was fired. He still showed up and did this appearance. You know, if you got fired off your main event, it's, I doubt you would want to promote it and be out in public. Right. And that's all they talked about. And he would not say, you know, uh, Letterman was going, what kind of idiot would fire you? No, he's a very nice man. He was a nice man. He just didn't like my, he would not, he would not be smirch. The guy that made class act. He, the, the most classic. Don Olmeyer. Yeah. And it occurred to me, and I was talking to my buddies on a text chain the other day, a bunch of comics, and I said, you know, this wasn't Norm's time. 
He didn't want to live in a world of Don Allmeyers, everyone trying to cancel everybody. Right. You know, it, it, it was interesting that he's gone now. Did you know he was sick? I didn't know. No, me either. You said you had two stories. There was, uh, what's the other one? Oh, so he'd invite me over to SNL once in a while to play poker on off nights, on Monday nights or something. And to watch him play poker while watching Monday night football and a baseball game, like he was a gambler. Right. And I guess somehow one time I found myself on a tape night on a live SNL. I'm in the hallway with a bunch of pages, writers, you know, basically plus ones filling out the hallway. I don't know if you, you know, I'm sure you've been up there enough to know that where, where the, where, where the reception is, there's a lot of hubbub, right? You can go to the dressing rooms this way and to the right is the studio and you know, right. uh, 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 makeup and uh, there's a lot going on. Yeah. I believe Rosie O'Donnell was hosting SNL and her very best friend, Penny Marshall, uh, was uh, there to support her. Penny Marshall, at the height of her movie director swag, is walking through the hallway with her head down, sunglasses on, baseball hat, doesn't want to be bothered, treating all these basically writers and NBC employees and me and Norm as big-timing us, pretending we're just looky-loos out on the street, right? Just right. doing a celebrity don't bother me moment. Fly by. Fly by. Thank you. And Norm picks up on it and he just starts pointing and screaming, Laverne, Laverne, <laughs> <laughs> Laverne. <laughs> <laughs> and she didn't look up. She never knew it was Norm. She's just gone. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> And of course, the whole hallway's falling down. Like, I, I wonder if he's doing it now. Uh, up there. <laughs> up there. <laughs> She's up there, too. Wow, those are great stories. Man, you are living a life. I hope you realize the life that you're living. And these experiences are uh, few, few and far between for most people in this world. And you, you navigate it wonderfully. You're a good human being. And that's, you know, that always... Thanks. It kind of affects me more than even, and I think you're brilliantly funny, and I think that your career is good, and I, I, I think people know that not only are they watching the roast and watching your material, but that's is your baby. You know, you produce it, it comes to the screen, bumping mics. These are all great, you know, kind of original, even though a roast was done before, but not like this. You know, it wasn't that Dean Martin roast didn't look the same, feel the same. And you are changing pop culture. Thank you. Adam. You also realize, you know, you're, you're a real good soul and human. And those are few and far between, you know, especially we kind of bump into them in this business. Because mm. I think that in, in other forms of uh, other occupations, people must hide within themselves who they really are. And I think that people who are successful in our business uh, are given license to be who they really are, you know? And they, people always say, you know, fame really changed them and then it became such an asshole. Well, no, you were an asshole, but you knew you couldn't act like an asshole because you were trying to get famous, trying to get the job, trying to get to the party. But once you're invited and it is your party, then the real you comes out. And you're one of the few with such great success and so much um, opportunity. And I think you give a lot of other people opportunities too. So many people have been blasted i think out of the the roasts i think that's what and the roast battles and the roast battles but so many people's career came right out of the roast i i think that amy uh, schumer mm -hmm. has the roasts to thank and uh, many other people mm -hmm. who got who were put on the map so you've i, I did want to ask i know that people come up to you all the time dad and ask for you to judge their talents and stuff like that because you're on agt does anyone ever come up to you and asks you to roast them just off the street like a string they do yeah <laughs> they do how do you even do that <laughs> you can judge no but you know what he's amazing at that because that's what i found fascinating in all the shows that we've done we did a, a gala for jfl the last time we actually worked on the same show he has the ability and i watch him do it live on instagram do you are you still doing it on instagram sometimes yeah it's i do it like when i'm when i'm stuck inside in a rainstorm or 
you know. So he's able to call people just from the audience. Just and this is not pre-planned, not pre-written. He doesn't know who's going to show up. He doesn't right. know what they're wearing. Right. He doesn't know what their occupation. And that's what he's not given credit for is your improvisational skills and your wittiness Thank in the you. moment to be able to just look at somebody and size them up and not only size them up and, you know, roast them but roast them viciously in the most loving, fun way where everybody's just laughing as your mother is being eviscerated in front of an entire crowd. And that's why, you know, even I was afraid for you when you did, I, I don't know how many of his, I've watched everything, but even his special from um, uh, prisons, mm. you know, did that, was that scary? It, it was genuine, it's still scary because they're all getting out now. <laughs> <laughs> and I did get a weird uh, Instagram DM from one of the uh, white supremacists with the swastika tattoos. Like, I'm out, motherfucker. And oh I don't know God. if he's being scary or joking. It seems scary. How do we find out? I don't uh, want to find out. I did talk to a security person who said to ignore it. But, um, <laughs> oh my God. Um, I, I, le I learned early on that this was going to be my lane that I couldn't always wait for Justin Bieber or Alec Baldwin or Donald Trump or whoever to say, please roast me. Let's put a tuxedo on and do it. I wanted to be able to roast folk music, folk, folk comedy style, like the regular people. Right. Um, and that's when I started bringing audience members up. And I don't pick people. Like, I love Don Rickles, my idol. But, you know, you sat in the front row. You were essentially volunteering. Right. At a Rickle show. Right. But, and and, and, and that, that is an important part of it. Right. But when I say, who wants to come up here, I put the house lights on and hands go up. And if someone points to someone, I go, stop pointing, that's bullying. Put your hand up or put it down. Don't point. I don't want anybody coerced or pushed up there. And once you get that consent... You can say anything. It is kind of amazing. I follow you on Instagram and on Instagram lives, those are amazing because they're going, roast me, roast me. And everybody just wants to be, you know, uh, kind of humiliated. I'm using the wrong word. <laughs> it's a but, badge of honor. Yeah, it is a badge of honor. And I'm willing to be humiliated. But that also shows how self-assured you are if you're willing to do that publicly. You wouldn't. You wouldn't do a roast. I think uh, you uh, would. No, no, no. no uh, you I would be roasted. I, uh, I've been asked a couple of times. I, I feel... You have very strong opinions about making fun of people. But at the same point, you know, a lot of people won't do pranks because they think it's mean. But I don't think that's mean. I don't... The, the intent is not mean. But let's just debate this for a second. Okay. When you're pranking someone, they're not... You're catching them off guard. And that's the comedy. Okay. Right? You don't have consent to Well, the, the, the comedy for me is this. The comedy for me is that we are all fish out of water. Everybody has that dream that you show up at the party in your underpants, you know, or you walk into a room and you feel uncomfortable. You're not sure what's going on. I love the comedy, even though I have an act and, and whatnot. I love the comedy of um, real awkward, uncomfortable situations because I feel like I'm always awkward and uncomfortable. And I use comedy to make me comfortable. If I wasn't laughing, I'd be crying. I'm just uncomfortable. And I came to it, we've talked about this. I came to this, Alan Funt was my hero. And I didn't understand stand-up comedy. My parents bought albums. Candy my, camera. Yeah, my parents bought album, comedy albums and they watched The Tonight Show and there'd be comics and my parents would be laughing in the living room and I wanted to go in and see what they were laughing at. I was four or five years old. And somebody would be talking about their mother-in-law. I don't know what a mother-in-law is. I don't know what that is. I didn't understand the jokes. Right. The one time I saw Candid Camera and I was sitting with them and Alan Funt explained to me, you know, and I've told this story so many times and so many I've never other, heard this. okay, so uh, he explained to me that he's going to pretend he's uh, this is his office and that he's hired a receptionist. The receptionist don't know that they're on a TV show. Right. And the receptionist is told by him they must answer the phone and they must never miss a call. That's the most imperative thing. I need to get every message there is. You cannot miss a phone call. Then he tells me that he tied one of the legs of the desk to a rope, which is drilled through a hole in the wall in the next room, so that when the phone rings, when she goes to reach for the phone, somebody on the other side of the wall is going to pull the rope and the desk is going to slide across the room so she can't reach the phone. <laughs> so see, you just laughed before it happened. And that was what got me. So what happened was, he, I felt like, I'm in on this. 
And this is, I remember he said, and, and we're about to do it. She's about to sit down. I remember turning to my parents with such anticipation, such excitement, such joy at what it's kind of like when you're throwing a surprise party for somebody and they're, oh, they're, they're coming up the driveway yet. Yeah, they're coming up the driveway. And here's how I reckon with it. If you are going to, I did a show at Fox called Mobbed where people gave uh, important life messages to people, but they would be in the middle of a flash mob at the time when there was flash mobs. <laughs> it, it did really well and it was good, but they would argue with me because they thought that the beginning was mean. And I think if I love you and I wanna throw a surprise party for you, then I have to make you think that everybody forgot your fucking birthday. Nobody gives a shit. Everybody's <laughs> made other plans. They've all made other plans with everybody else but you, so you're left out. Right. I need to drop you to the lowest, darkest spot that I could drop you so that when you open that door and it's a party, then that is such joy. So the point is- Beautiful. It that, is beautiful. If you're thinking about it that deeply, then I'm on board. So when I give people, when I prank, but even, and then I think, you know, even if I'm doing prank phone calls, we do a lot on this show, so it's just a, what is at stake? There's somebody at a business and I'm making ridiculous requests, you know? How long will they stay on the phone? Even as little as, it's not always this happy ending, but if a spam call is coming in, you know, where I, my extended warranty, I try to see how long I can keep them on the phone. <laughs> you know, they're calling me, they can hang up anytime. Is that mean? Uh, it's not mean. Someone will say, well, they're making minimum wage and you're a big shot calling them. To me, that's a secondary thing as opposed to the human interaction of making people laugh, making your fans laugh. There's a greater good going on. I have a hard time pranking people or even surprising people. The roast is to your face, which is arguably harder in some ways because now you're intimidated, you know? Here's my thing. In order for the joke to be funny, there's got to be a seed of truth, of honesty. So if you're talking about the eight shitty movies that somebody did, I'm willing to laugh <laughs> at myself, but because it's not me, I don't want to talk about your shitty movies because I don't know. And even if you're laughing, are you laughing because it's uncomfortable? Like, I don't know that. I'm hearing it after and they go, it was the best time of my life. But it scares me that th there's two things I won't do personally. I won't roast. And I was called a couple of times to, to do it. Sure. And I, at, right at the beginning. Right. And, and uh, I, I said, I can't. And the other thing is I can't be on a game show as a celebrity playing for a civilian because I don't want my silliness or ineptness to be the re responsible for you not leaving with as much money as you po could possibly have met. That sure. would break my heart sure. if you lost because, and in my mind, I distracted you or did something silly or were doing something for the benefit of my career over you winning money. I see. That's what happened. I, I, I like that. Well, that's what happened. You know, deal or no deal was the, I, I said no to it. My wife made me do it because my career was waning so shitty. And I hired uh, uh, comedy writers. And then when I went out on stage and I met the first person, the, and they let me hire comedy writers and I had so much material. I was gonna be on five nights on, on uh, uh, St. Elsewhere. I saw that the, the contestant who I'd met, this would change their life. If they walked out of there with 10 grand, her life would be changed. She sure. could put a down payment on health insurance for her kids. She could buy an apartment. So, and I saw she was in a glaze on the stage. So I, changed, I didn't do anything funny. And I just said, you know, fuck it. This is a real human being right here. So that's why I said, you know, the offer, and I just wanted them to hear it. You're not on TV. This is not pretend. The offer is $60,000. That's why I did that, just so they could deal or no. I wasn't trying to be dramatic. I was trying to talk to her like I talked to her when she was five years old. Take the fucking money. Right. Take the fucking money. You got to leave here and your life will be better than it was when you came. And I was so embarrassed with what I had done on Deal or No Deal, because I said, I didn't do comedy. I didn't play a character. I didn't do funny voices. I just wanted people to be better off. That's all I wanted. And I thought it was so, so embarrassing. And huh. it, nobody is more surprised than me that that actually took off. And it was actually the biggest success of my life to date. But you were an SNL character, the the slow. Yeah, but, but <laughs> forgive me, Fred Armisen. I mean, yeah. yeah. So what I'm hearing, and you used your daughter as an example. You're more than a comedian at this point. Now you're a, a made man who's got a family, and you're using that. 
on television, the way you were talking to those people. Take the deal. It's like talking to your daughter when she's 15. Go to take the SATs. Yes. Go to college. Right. Trust me. I know you want to take the next year off and jerk around, but do this. Prom. I, I promise you, me, you'll be. So you use that. I did, but I wasn't allowed to. You know, standards and practices. I couldn't finish the sentence. I can only. You know. I see. You could. You couldn't take them in there. So would you, but, but you weren't using this. You, you were using your reputation as a comedian to get the job or whatever. Maybe to promote the show. But not necessarily on the right, show, right? But you know how which scary. I respect. But you know, you're also a made guy. You know, at this point, for you and I to be able to have this conversation like this on a national platform, this is kind yeah. of a, we would have never done this right. before. And if you did this and we had this conversation, you'd walk out of here going, "That was fuck." That, you know, what audience is going to? They're into it now, and they want to hear what you think because of what you've done. I see. And so how you're they like ten years ago, you didn't feel that way. I Your didn't business know, decisions. How would I know that they would accept me if I didn't have a setup and a punchline, if I wasn't wearing a funny little uh, getup, if I didn't do something silly? That's what I. That's how I had made every dollar, every laugh, every acceptance, every job was for that. Deal or no deal was the first job I took where it was just, I showed up and just was myself. Hmm. We well, did dramatic television. But that was pretend. I I'm see. not a doctor, you know I that. See. I just played one on TV. Oh. Now I got it. Now you get it. Anyway, I can't thank you enough for doing what you do, being who you are. Um, we don't see each other a lot, and a lot of people in this business don't. I do love you, and I do think that you're a great human being, and I'm glad I know you, and it was an honor that you would even show up today and come in and talk to me. Thank you, Allie. They'll thank you. I, I really enjoyed this conversation. Didn't you enjoy him? Yes. I wish I could have been in the room. No. <laughs> she loves to play I really, Hamilton. I really enjoyed talking to you, and I always do, and, and uh, you, you're a mensch. So are you on the road right now? You know, I'm going uh, underground for a secret reality show thing next week, and then I'm going overseas for a secret stand-up thing. So worst plugs ever. <laughs> <laughs> well, watch for those. There's a and lot gentlemen. of fun stuff happening that's a surprise. Okay, so we'll if you uh, Caroline's in December, I'll be back in New York. That's that's up and out there. But look for the surprises. Time. We'll be posting his surprises probably on, on his social media, right? You'll announce. Yeah, it when you can. yeah. There's a lot of fun stuff hanging ha happening, and I am enjoying being a comedian. I saw you the other night at an outside show a couple times. I, it's like a hobby. I feel like I have no job. I have a hobby that pays. I love being a com comedian right now. I think people need it more than ever. And there's something about, I'm not doing a, uh, my act is evolving. It's becoming more personal. And I, I feel like before I'm a Jew or an American, I'm in this comedy thing. And when I see the comedians and, and when I see you, I, I get lifted up. I ran into... And do you love working with Chappelle? I love working with Chappelle. Um, I just did eight shows with him in Detroit. I was a spe I come out as a special guest, unannounced. Um, and his crowds are just the best crowds, sophisticated. They're just euphoric when he comes out and he lets me roast the crowd and just shake everything up and Fantastic. i know the guy 30 years so the whole thing is like a family well i can't wait to work with you sometime again if not we should just uh, break bread at some i would point. love that i'll come out to your fancy spot i have fancy <laughs> spots <laughs> love you howie I love you too and uh, i guess we could just end the let's end the podcast <laughs> Get a, a picture for behind.